<laughs> Good evening, everyone. I call the hybrid in-person virtual meeting of the Wild Joseph School Board to order. It is 7.04 p.m. on Monday, September 28, 2020. I'm in conference room C of the Fisher Building at 12121 West North Avenue, with board members participating in person and remotely via the video conferencing platform Zoom. Due to active health and safety concerns associated with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic public health emergency. We will begin with the moment of silent reflection. Ms. Newman, please call the roll. Mr. Doman? Here. Ms. Braley? Here. Mr. Meyer? Here. Ms. Neufeld? Here. Mr. Phillips? Excused. Mr. Rowland? Here. Dr. Jessup Anger? Here. Mira Garcharia? Here. Aiden Jones? Here. Thank you all. It's good to see you in person or virtually this evening. We are going to begin with a public comment on any non-agenda items. Members of the Wauwatosa School Board value the input of students, parents, staff members, and community members. The board's regularly scheduled meetings provide an opportunity for opinions and concerns to be expressed publicly. The board values all comments and will respectfully consider this input and decision making. The board requests that individuals limit their comment on each item to three minutes. Following any comment, an individual board member may respond to the issue raised. However, it is not the intent of the public comment portion of the agenda for the board to enter into a debate with members, a member or members of the community. Because non-agenda items are not publicly posted in advance, no action will be taken on public comment regarding non-agenda items this evening. Uh, a quick note on this, I've seen this quite a bit on social media, is folks often come into public comment with questions. Um, and while questions are fantastic, uh, public comment is not a time where we engage in a question and answer. Um, so what the board is really looking for is your perspective, uh, your advocacy, um, your input into different decision making, uh, but we are not uh, set up really to be answering questions during public comment. So please, if you have them, uh, know that uh, I've asked uh, our district leadership team to be making sure we're noting common questions that we're getting and those things are noted on our, on our ongoing FAQs on the website. But any questions really will likely not be answered uh, during any public comments now or going forward. Uh, certainly, if you've got questions, reach out to principals, to teachers, to the leadership team of the district, uh, email school board members, give us a call. But public comment is really not the time for the QA per se. Um, we would go on forever. Uh, with that uh, as our starting point, uh, any public comments on any non agenda items this evening? There are no hands right. Oh, we do have one. Sorry. Adam Cadillac, please state your name and address. You have the microphone. Adam Cadillac. You need Sorry, to I was on mute. I was on mute. <laughs> um, Adam Cadillac, 1639 Alta Vista. Wauwatosa. Um, I had a general comment. Is is this the time to make that? I'm sorry, it's my first time to the meeting. I know it's not your guys' first time. Um, and what, what we do is we generally start each meeting um, with a public comment on anything that is not on the agenda. Oh, it's not on the agenda. Okay. Correct. Yeah, so sorry. anything that's on the agenda, uh, we would ask that it be commented on at the point that we are talking about that specific agenda. Okay. I apologize. Never mind. I'll be back. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. I appreciate your restraint. Uh, we have no other raised hands. Sounds good. We will move into our uh, consent agenda then. Are there any items on the consent agenda which board members would like to remove for separate discussion and action? Here. Nothing to be removed, but can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so Dr. Earl, I was curious, there's a lot of donations that came in, and I was wondering if we could hear a little bit more about were these part of a package, solicited? It just seemed like a lot all at once. 
think it's a lot related to a technology education program at East High School. Um, and I was just going to comment that it's, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes we forget how much our community supports the schools, and this is just an example of from AHRI, from Bob Anderson Builders, Story Hill Builders, Carpenters Training Institute, um, Milwaukee Tool, just examples of uh, neighborhood and community resources that support the school district. So um, just an ongoing partnership that we continue to work with these folks on. Great. Well, thank you to everybody who donated. And just to say to the public out there, like donations to Dr. Erdl's point are really helpful. I know we donated our kids old instruments <laughs> uh, one year when the time came that they were no longer playing them. So thank you to all of these folks who, who made these donations. If I can just add one more, the, the donation of $1,000 for the over, overdue meal account. Um, we, have, we have people that struggle with that and we've, we've solicited Donations in the past, this is a really big one. So thank you very much to uh, Aaron Van Duver. Aaron. Yeah, thank you. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Gomez. Any other board comment or questions in the session? Any community comment or questions on this item? There are no hands raised. Awesome. Um, Liam, thank you for asking the question. Actually, I saw the comment this evening, or I saw it this evening, and I asked, emailed um, Dr. Earl of, um, uh, to, to share a little bit more about the, those donations and to call those out, because it's a, a pretty big thing for members of our community, particularly those who have expertise uh, in trades, uh, in other areas, our launch program really counts on a variety of different folks in the community to be engaged and participate. Um, but thanks to everybody who volunteers time, expertise, uh, in this case, tools and resources uh, to help kids on uh, this program. Or in the case of um, the launch, um, what, what a great gift. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Newman, please come up. Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Newfeld? Yes. Mr. Rowling? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. None passes. Um, I'm going to ask for uh, consent of the board to adjust our agenda this evening. Currently, we have a Medical Public Health Advisory Committee update under 4A, uh, and I would like to move that above the superintendent action item, which is approval of the recommendation to stay in current educational model until December 1st, 2020. Uh, two reasons I'd like to do that. One, we've got some guests with us who are willing to report, and um, it was really an oversight on my part for not having that lo uh, located first, so that we would hear that update report and have any conversation on that before any uh, consideration of, of the recommendation would be. Um, Want to see if uh, the board would consent to that adjustment. I agree. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So we will uh, shift to the top of our agenda, the superintendent report, medical public health advisory committee updates. Um, and we've got a few folks who are here with us. Also as a reminder to the community, Mr. Dolman is the board liaison to this group, uh, and uh, Dr. Erdl, among others, um, and Marcia Kwiatkowski, who is also in the room, are also members on that uh, from the district administration. So um, please, uh, the floor is um, yours for the update. So Ms. Kwiatkowski, I'll let you go. You were working on the presentation, so if you could just kind of do a little intro. Thank you. We had our meeting um, last Wednesday when Medical Advisory Committee uh, reviewed that um, the current dashboard, and we have two medical um, um, experts online. They're going to go over um, the numbers and talk about extending hybrid and their uh, recommendations. Great, I think I will start. Um, good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Leslie Cockrum. 
I'm an infectious disease physician, a Wauwatosa parent, and a member of the Medical Advisory Panel. Um, thank you for the time and the opportunity to speak today. I'm looking to briefly review the metrics and to share additional information that we took into consideration as we decided to support the recommendation to stay in the current model of education. In looking at our scorecard, um, you can see that it, it doesn't look necessarily terribly different from when we reviewed it a few weeks ago. Uh, our cases are still in the red range, um, but our test positivity and our hospitalization rates are in the green. However, as I'm sure you are all aware and following, um, we are seeing trends increase, um, and not just in our uh, local communities, but also in our surrounding communities. And when you look at um, our dashboard of data that has um, several different levels, again, district, community, county, and state, um, these are all things that we follow. Um, we know that not all of our students and their families live in Wauwatosa. And we also recognize that many of our staff live in the surrounding counties, including Waukesha, uh, Ozaki, Washington. Um, so that is something that we are following. Um, and we've obviously seen that a lot of those cases and those um, rates have gone very high um, as of recent. Um, we are also uh, realizing that these um, things can change very quickly, which is not a surprise to us. Um, but it does mean that um, we sometimes see our Wauwatosa data lag a little bit um, behind some of the surrounding communities. Um, so it is something where we are looking to uh, update update our dashboard a bit more frequently as we continue on. In addition to just looking at the, the community metrics that we um, laid out, we have been, um, of course, observing, um, again, what the surrounding school districts are also doing. So it's something that we review. Um, not surprisingly, many of the school districts have dashboards uh, that are similar to ours. So we are watching those uh, schools that are uh, doing five-day instruction and looking at those rates. Um, unfortunately, we have seen um, a lot of those uh, districts um, have a lot of cases, um, and it is something that, um, again, we're just taking into consideration and trying to learn as much as we can um, about this uh, about this pandemic and, and the school's effect on that. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, we are also taking into consideration uh, information as we head into the uh, fall and winter season. Um, as an infectious disease physician, um, I often see, of course, that colds and flu, uh, flus go up during this time. Um, we also have holidays where families tend to congregate, Thanksgiving and those kind of holidays. Um, with us all, all coming indoors now with the weather changing, um, we do, uh, you know, look to see how that will affect um, our COVID rates as well. Um, lastly, um, we obviously are watching to see what is going on in our uh, schools, watching uh, the staff attendance rate as well as the students. Um, we are doing very well in that so far. We've certainly seen um, very few cases uh, in our, of either our staff or students, so this is um, voting well so far for the current model that we are in. Um, and we're seeing uh, fewer um, cases of quarantines compared to perhaps some others um, that are doing a five-day instruction model. So taking all of this into consideration, um, we do support the recommendation to stay in our current model of instruction. Hello everyone, um, I'm Dr. Chastity Brimmeyer. I'm a pediatric psychologist, also a member of the advisory um, committee and a TOSA parent. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the social and emotional and academic lens that we took in considering um, whether or not we support staying in hybrid instruction until December. And we do from this perspective for a couple of different reasons. Um, first, we know that, and probably most importantly, some teachers are teaching both phase into learning and TOSA connected students. And we don't yet have a plan for managing the logistics of that successfully. That's still under development. Um, we're still looking at best practices for that concurrent learning model, um, especially when we're considering our younger grades. Um, we need technology and equipment to make that happen. And um, we don't have that yet. So the group 
thought that moving to five day in person before any of these things were in place may result in um, putting our TOSA connected students at a disadvantage. We also recognize that one of the best ways that we can deal with stress or mitigate stress is consistency and predictability. Um, we really want to be cautious about moving to five day in person um, only to have it shut down um, and go full virtual and potentially have this back and forth occur more than once. Um, as Dr. Cockerum mentioned, there's a bigger risk for this in the coming months. And so we wanted to be mindful of that. Um, more face-to-face -face learning is our ultimate goal, uh, but we think that staying in hybrid mode is going to reduce our overall need to quarantine um, while also maintaining face-to-face -face learning um, rather than going from the extreme of in-person to virtual and that having that back and forth I mentioned. We think that this will provide families and students and our staff with more structure and predictability um, by minimizing that need to quarantine to the extent that we're able to. Uh, we, and we also just want to allow students and families and staff uh, more time to iron out issues with Canvas and in-person learning or home learning um, so that we can get a clearer picture of what is working and what is not working in hybrid mode um, versus maybe what just might be growing pains or things that logistical things that we need to work out with this new model. Um, I realize that there's probably a question about whether or not hybrid instruction is a, as effective as, you know, five day in person learning. Um, anecdotally, we can say that school staff are starting to see that with smaller class sizes, um, students and teachers are moving through their material more efficiently, more effectively. There's less distraction in the classroom, um, more individualized time with teachers. So there's more opportunity for students and teachers to kind of develop relationships. Mm -hmm. And those relationships are very important when it comes to um, learning and achievement. Mm -hmm. And staff are starting to see improvement in anxiety and peer conflict, which is actually something that I'm also observing in my practice. Um, and teachers are rapidly adapting to instruction for home. Uh, I did do a quick review of the literature um, just to try to get a better understanding of hybrid learning. And what I found was that the pandemic sort of fast tracked uh, educational methods like hybrid. These were under consideration before COVID hit. Um, and we don't yet have a lot of data comparing the effectiveness of hybrid instruction versus all in person, um, particularly within the context of our pandemic. Um, but there is some research, um, it is emerging as I mentioned, um, but there is so, some studies that suggest greater achievement when compared to traditional learning for lower SES elementary students, um, significantly more student engagement and motivation for learning and a better understanding of academic content in middle school students. Um, some of the benefits that have been highlighted in research include greater student independence, more self-motivated learning, and students sort of taking ownership of their learning, and that applies to a greater range of life skills than just academic achievement. Um, it also affords the ability to individualize and differentiate learning goals. Um, we can adjust instruction to student learning. So for example, if a student doesn't understand a concept, they can rewatch a video or review some of those online materials. Um, and it really allows um, people to maximize that face-to-face -face time with teachers through um, you know, more collaboration with their classmates and their instructors. Um, so in a sense, research sort of suggests that we should use this unexpected opportunity um, and how we have to revamp everything um, to sort of change the way that we think about school and we create new learning opportunities. Um, that is to say hybrid's not without its challenges. Uh, it is dependent on how prepared and comfortable teachers are uh, with implementing the hybrid model. So we really need to invest in teachers. Um, thankfully, education research has long showed us that the most critical variable in learning success is the teacher, and that doesn't necessarily vary um, by the instructional format. And uh, we also know that many teacher practices from traditional classrooms can apply to hybrid. We just need time for them to be able to do that. Um, so we might wanna consider listening sessions, um, additional training or troubleshooting opportunities um, for Canvas and some of the other um, difficulties that come with trying to transfer your traditional curriculum to a hybrid and online format. We know that hybrid poses a challenge for our families because we're balancing work, childcare and home learning. Um, you know, 
parent newsletters may consider providing tips, access to childcare, getting creative about that. And uh, Canvas training videos for parents uh, might be something that would be helpful to consider. I know I personally would probably benefit from that. Um, we know that hybrid requires a lot of family support, especially at younger grades. So we wanna be mindful of, of that and allow plenty of support for uh, parent and parent guidance in that. So just in sum, uh, students, teachers, and families agree that person in-person learning is more effective. Um, and we believe that staying in hybrid is the best way that we can maintain that and avoid quarantines um, or full virtual learning outside of any extenuating circumstances. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I think that was a great explanation of uh, what our meeting was and the meeting that I don't have too much to add. Um, one note I did have um, was that we were that students were doing a great job as far as social distancing and mask wearing and things like that. That was a concern and a question you probably all went into how well that was going to go, but um, it seems that that is working uh, fairly well. Like, I'm sure it's not 100%, but um, certainly doing real well in that space. And then continuing to hybrid just sort of helps us continue those, to practice those good habits and, and get us into a comfortable space with that. So another reason to continue there. Um, yeah, I think that's probably one of the points I've worked on. Fully, fully supportive of the decision. That's been proposed by Dr. Okay, Questions and comments? Yes, Dr. Ryan. Thank you. Um, a question about the the learning research is there, and I'm sorry, I can't, sometimes I can't always hear every phrase over the Zoom, so I apologize if I miss something. But is there any indication of what is happening with our achievement gap students um, with respect to the model that we're in now, or is it too soon to tell? Um, a little bit of both. I found one study that showed that we can close achievement gaps with, um, with the hybrid learning model, but it is dependent on a lot of factors. It's de dependent on fidelity, um, engagement, and assessment, and some of the things that I think we're still ironing out. Um, I also find a couple of great examples that I'm willing to provide um, for other school districts that have implemented this model. Um, Miami-Dade County is one of them that has successfully used um, hybrid to sort of address those achievement gaps. Um, so there's potential. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was curious for the um, for the folks from the medical advisory panel. Can you tell me a little bit more about like what what you think the possibilities are, or how do we get back to five day? Um, you know, I'm supportive of where things are right now. Um, I see all the data coming out that is saying you know Wisconsin is basically top of the list, getting ready to explode. Um, and I agree that I don't wanna see us flip-flopping between models. At the same time, I also would love to see us get back to five day. Um, and so I'm curious like what you all will be looking for um, so that again, we have enough time to prepare our teachers to make that switch as well because their preparation and readiness and comfort um, with, with that change is gonna be really important as this is not just a short-term challenge, this is a long-term commitment that we have to our teachers um, that goes beyond this year. Yes, it's a really excellent question. Um, again, just to echo, I think um, what Dr. Brinmeyer said, you know, that's definitely our goal is to get to five-day instruction. Um, I do think we're really challenged right now with what's going on in our communities. Obviously, um, I think it was even said earlier in this meeting, the connection between our schools and our communities is really strong. And um, we have these great uh, measures that are in place right now in our schools. Um, you know, the, the current model really allows us to do things like to, to distance and to have these really small class sizes that allows us to 
not have to quarantine a whole class or the teacher or multiple classes if there is a case that comes in. And I think that's the, the real concern when you have such high community rates that um, obviously we, we don't exist in bubbles. We still need to uh, move around our communities so that um, those, those cases will unfortunately find their way into the schools. Um, we see that to a small degree, but again, it doesn't take out the rest of our, our school and, and have us to quarantine. I think, to be honest, what we're seeing in some of the other schools right now that are going five days a week, there is, we are seeing some case um, or child to child spread. Um, they are certainly seeing that, and especially some of our the northern counties. Um, but we're also seeing community cases coming in, and then because of the inability to really distance, that quarantining a lot of uh, students, so pulling them out um, of the classroom, unfortunately. Um, so I, you know, I think the big challenge is is really um, how do we get our communities to to get on board with the continue these mitigation um, efforts. I know it's it's tiring and, and everything, but how do we um, continue to, you know, wear our mask, avoid those large gatherings to keep our kids in school because that's what we we all want. Um, so I think it's we need to keep those community rates down, um, keep exercising the the same strategies, uh, not just in our schools, but outside of our schools. Um, and hopefully we we can get there. I would only add that um, we we make sure that we're offering when we do phase in to five day in person that it's an equitable offering to our TOSA connected students um, and that doesn't in any way become a detriment to their to their learning. I have a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, one thing I didn't hear. Uh, tonight much is the virtual learning. I know we talked about the cases increasing and it's a good possibility that we may have to be all virtual and what what did the committee panel discuss that as an option and a you know and the threshold for that? Yeah, we we did, you know, um, obviously, I think a couple of things. One, we're again recognizing that things are changing very quickly. Um, where we were two weeks ago is, seems very long ago now and very different than where we are as, as a community and as a state. Um, again, I think that um, we're currently finding that our model is seeming to, at the very least, mitigate some of the outside effects from the community. Um, and we also are seeing that um, our direct TOSA community is faring a little bit better than some of our, our surrounding communities. We know that that may not stay that way. Um, but again, I think, you know, given where the numbers are at this moment and our desire to do as much in-person learning as we can, we, we decided to, you know, stay with the recommendation of the current model. But um, I do think it's it's a rapidly changing um, landscape and something that we're following closely. Um, if we can continue to see that our cases in the schools are staying low, our staff are staying safe, then um, we'd like to be able to continue in this model as long as we can. Thank you. Um, one additional question. I, I think there's a a question in the community in terms of the transparency as to what happens in these meetings. Um, it's a bunch of brilliant local physicians that we're very grateful for coming together with time you don't have to have these discussions. Can you talk a little bit about like is there debate like what's the back and forth because as I'm sure you can imagine there's a lot of people that are, are not happy with this decision. Um, and so I, I'm just curious in an attempt to provide as much transparency as possible to parents who email and say, you know, my kid's hanging out with their friends, we've gone to small gatherings, this is not a big deal, Elmbrook is open, other districts are open, why are we different? What are the discussions that you all are having? Along yeah. No, it's a very good question. And we really do want to be, um, you know, as transparent as possible. 
Um, you know, a lot of it, it, you know, it starts with sort of reviewing the data as we have, reviewing our uh, scorecards. Um, you know, we, we discuss whether there's been any new studies. Um, obviously, again, this is rapidly changing. We're constantly learning about this disease and transmission and epidemiology. And so, you know, some of that initial, um, you know, discussion is sharing information back and forth. This was published in this journal. Uh, this was, you know, this was recently a study that came out. What can we learn? Um, we also, of course, rely on our different experiences. So, you know, we have uh, members of the committee that are in a public health departments. And so they talk about what they're seeing. Um, you know, we look at the, like I said, the dashboards of the schools around us. Uh, you know, we have uh, friends, for example, who are on other advisory panels in other communities. So we try to bring in as much information as we can um, just from all the sources that we, we potentially have. Um, and then we, there is some debate, you know, uh, we don't always agree 100% um, on things, but there is some kind of debate back and forth. You know, we talk about, are these the right numbers to watch? Do we need to adjust? Because um, again, we, we realize that our scorecard and metrics and everything may not be set in stone. Um, and then, you know, um, we, we try to take into consideration sort of the future, I think kind of getting at to, you know, what what's coming up down the road? How do we best prepare? You know, we obviously have no crystal balls, but how do we predict and using, you know, whatever information we have um, to, to kind of give us some that sense of what's going to happen in the future, just so we can make decisions or recommendations that um, don't force us to go back and forth. You know, we certainly don't want that for our family, for our staffs, for our um, our students at all. So um, again, it's, it's, it's bringing in all the information we can. There is some, certainly some debate um, because there's not uh, certainly a perfect answer, um, but I hope that's a little helpful. It is, and it's not to question your recommendation. It's just to try wherever possible to help families understand that, um, that we are looking to you all and we are not telling you all what you know, you know, we want. I think there are some misconceptions as to how this is working. So I just want to try and help clarify that for folks because people are suffering. This is hard for working parents. This is hard for kids. This is hard for everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. I would, I would add to that. Um, usually once uh, we've reviewed the data, um, there's also discussion about um, from the, the mental behavioral people on the board, um, how might this impact? Um, what are some aspects that we're not thinking of? How might this be received by the community? Um, and even last, the last meeting, I believe, um, it was posed like, okay, we're in agreement with this, but what are some reasons that we shouldn't stay in hybrid? And, and so we try to also consider, you know, play devil's advocate and um, consider opposing viewpoints as well. Thank you. I would just have one question for Dr. Earl, um, and I'd like to clear up because I think it's a question from the community. If if we didn't follow your recommendation, we went five days a week. We voted to do that tonight, or we vote to do that in December. Does that mean we go five days a week and post connect goes away, or those families who are coming back just isn't an option for them? health reasons or whatever the case is, and they want to continue to choose close to connect. Does close to connect stay as, as an option for them? Yeah, the plan is to continue with those connect to Toronto. The, the year as long as there's interest in it that was the plan when we started that we found that as an option all year long uh, we, we've also said that's going to change when we do have transitions um, so when people get that option to choose and, and trimester that's going to change and that kind of aligns with why this recommendation is set where it is so we can align those um those movements with um, with changing five, if we were able to go five days a week in December. So just to be clear, it's not that close to connect being offered is going to change, but close to connect how it operates, maybe teachers or things like that will change. Close to connect and stand would still be your plan as to offer it throughout the year. Correct. You might have to adjust as numbers change and things we like will. that. We yeah. will, yeah. I just want to clear that up this question I've got. Any other questions or comments from the board? We'll um, go to have some time dedicated here for community comments. Um, for anybody who has them, um, 
then we'll come, we'll come back to see if there's any other more comments or questions at the close. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on time, recognizing we've got a uh, action item um, for the school board to consider this evening on our, the recommendation that's coming. And there'll be another opportunity for community comment then. Um, so um, we'll, we'll start to just bang our, and I don't know what the right answer is here, but is community comment just relevant to what the committee presented, or is it relevant to the decision not to move into a hybrid? Because that's actually going to be an item later. So. This would just be to what the committee presented. Right. And there would be an option later when, when the board's going to get ready to go prior to that for, for the community to discuss I'm, and I'm share the, their thoughts on whether we should be hybrid. The shift to changing to yeah. sticking with hybrid through December, that would be appropriate for the next agenda. Thanks, I just wanted that to be clear. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Good clarification. Uh, again, a reminder, um, a time for comments. Um, and articulating perspective and opinion, uh, not a time for uh, the kind of detail question. Um, Jamie, are there any public comments on this item? Uh, Mark Z, you have your hand raised. You now have the mic. Please state your name and address. You'll need to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Um, Mark Smolik, 7928 Eagle Street. Um, my comment is just to, to what's been happening with um, with the hybrid learning. Um, the In my experience, the students aren't getting um, Mark, even I'm close. Gonna, I'm going to ask you to hold off on any. Okay. We're going to have a chance for this when we get into the next conversation. But this is so, just like really focused on kind of the presentation by the Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Jen Janowski, you have the microphone. Hi, thank you for taking my comment tonight. And I appreciate the, um, the comments from Drs. Cockerham and, and Brinmeyer. Uh, if you could just state your name and address, please. Oh, sorry. Jen Janowski, 2609 North 90th Street. Um, my I do have a concern that it, it feels like we voted on what the metrics were going to be for when the, the students would go back full time, yet very little of the conversation tonight was actually about the metrics. I heard a lot about, oh, what about TOSA Connected and an equity? And I heard a lot about uh, other benefits of being in the hybrid model. And I heard about, um, other generic things that had very little to do with the metrics. And so it really feels like we're trying to justify not going back full time, even if the metrics support us going back, which concerns me greatly because, I mean, I have lots of reasons why I would want to go back full time. Um, and I also heard us reference schools up north. Well, we've got two schools in our neighborhoods that are going full time with great success. They've been in school for a month with no issues. And I just, I think we're not, we can't see the trees through the forest kind of thing. So I would really like us to make sure we are sticking to the metrics and voting accordingly, not to some of these other, um, other data that was, was brought into the, the discussion. Thank you, Jen. Um, question for myself for uh, our advisory board members, just looking at the metrics, um, my, my, my sense from what you're saying, the metrics have gotten worse, not better, since the last recommendation. If, if, you're, if the only thing that we're looking at is the metrics, and again, I, I am not advocating for that. I think that would be uh, limiting uh, in our understanding. Is there anything that you're seeing in the metrics that makes you believe that we are improving our current environment for the spread of COVID in the context of Wauwatosa, Milwaukee, and Wisconsin? So I can I can ask, answer that and and thank you Jen I do appreciate your point because uh, it was very brief the review of our current scorecard and where we're at so um, with our looking at our current scorecard the cases puts us uh, solidly in red um, which is where we were a few weeks ago um, which what is different this time is our actually our trend is really increasing um, where we were actually a couple of weeks ago our trend was decreasing so we were 
better when we looked at our scorecard a few weeks ago than we are currently. Um, and I think what, what I mean about looking at um, the surrounding communities is that um, we are seeing our percent of uh, positivity rise. We're not into the yellow or the red yet, um, but looking at what's happened at the communities near us, um, you know, a week ago, um, they weren't quite there yet and now they are. So I think we're, um, again, looking at our scorecard, not changing um, that, and we are solidly in red on two of our four indicators, but also realizing that while we're in green, for example, on the test positivity, we may not be tomorrow. And that's part of um, our plan is to really update that dashboard more, uh, more often um, than we currently are to really reflect that changing landscape. That would be helpful, thank you. I appreciate your, your answer to that question. The other thing I would add to that is um, new this week is on the scorecard, uh, we have TOSA listed with the metrics, but also Mo Milwaukee County excluding TOSA to sort of, I think, be more transparent about the surrounding community and how we're anticipating the potential impact of that. Um, and as Dr. Cochran said, uh, we want to update the frequency of that um, just because I think, you know, the week, a lot can happen in a week when we're in this pandemic. Um, so just to kind of provide more information for families and parents and see where we're coming from when we make decisions. Um, and the final idea that we had thought too is uh, just summarizing the scorecard and the dashboard with text, um, recognizing that not all individuals really appreciate um, visuals, but also just you know to create a summary of what's happening um, in the past week that might be helpful for community members as well. Um, one nice thing I would also point out for the community, uh, if you're watching and haven't gotten through, no doubt, a lot of email that's in your inbox, uh, this week, uh, and today I signed up last week, and today was the first time I in my inbox. You can sign up for a daily update on uh, the dashboard, so you can kind of get dumped into your email. You can go on the website, but it also will push out to you, and you can see a look, a look, look of cases, uh, drill down to the school level, number of cases and quarantines and so on. Uh, and so that's a possibility. Um, Jamie, how many other folks do we have in line and we've got? I'm kind of excited about this our first in-person community comment that will be happening in several months. So I'm going to call on you after we're done with maybe two more. Thank you. Six people with their hands raised. Right. We're going to do two online, one here in the room, and then we'll come back to the folks who are virtual. So do two now? Yes, sir. Okay, Whitney Neal, please state your name and address. You have the microphone. You'll need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, Whitney Neal, 4188 North 98th Street. Uh, my question is on the December 1st date. Um, I was just kind of looking. I First of all, I very much appreciate everything. Uh, Whitney? You have, Whitney? Hi, this yes. is Eric. I just want to point out. This is not a question and answer time, so you can ask the question, but we're, we're really, we're, oh, this would be a better time for you to advocate for a perspective that you may have. Oh, um, well, I was hoping to just get a quick um, indicator of what, why the December 1st date, I guess, was selected by the medical board, if that was, if there was a reasoning behind that, or if it was just a future date. I, I was just curious if that was if that was specific or not. Uh, that'll be covered a little bit later in the presentation uh, when Dr. Earl kind of goes through the timing uh, of the record. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, <laughs> Greta McCool, you have the microphone. You'll need to unmute yourself. Please state your name and address. Good evening. This is Greta McCool. I'm at 806 North 112th Street. 
Um, as a TOSA school district mom and a medical professional, I am in full favor of continuing the hybrid model. I firmly believe that we have parents in our community who will send symptomatic children to school with or without a positive COVID test. And I like that we are in smaller cohorts, so our uh, risk of exposure is lower. And um, at work, we've been keeping close tabs on the growing number of positive cases that we have. and. I know from personal experience that no screening tool is perfect. People will get through multiple screening tools and still um, be right there to expose you. So I think that this current plan is a good one. Thank you. And Jamie, we're gonna take a comment from in the boardroom, which I'm really excited about. We have the new boardroom coming. Baby steps. Hello, uh, Joe McClough. Joe, I'd ask you to keep your face mask on. Joe McClough from 772 North 116th Street in Tosa. Um, all respect to the Michael Advisory Board. I uh, appreciate their work. However, I think what we are doing is we are framing things in such a way as to make things overly restrictive for the metrics that we will never get back to the five-day learning plan. The one metric that turned from yellow to red is the 14-day positive per 100,000. If we look at this category in particular, we would need to have an average of only seven positives per day per 100,000, with Tulsa having a population of about 50,000. That would make it 3.5 positives on average over a 14-day period. This is almost impossible to achieve. It may not be happening now or in the future. This disease may be with us long-term in the future, like the flu, and we may be having positive cases of long-term. Even with the vaccine that many experts believe, this is supposed to remain in the community. What we need to do is we need to stop focusing on surrounding communities so much. 90% of the students in the district come from Mamatosa. If nothing else, that should be strongly, heavily weighted in that direction, showing the very positive effects here in Tosa. Looking at the Balotoka Health Department metrics, we are in very good standing here in Tosa and we need to move forward. There is no reason to believe that we go to December, things are gonna get any better. More likely they're going to get worse as we're gonna be closed indoors in closer spaces. Irony of all ironies, the district is allowing students to participate in sports with close contact participating and practicing, playing and practicing five days per week, and yet they will not allow students back in the classroom in a more controlled environment. We need to stop making excuses to keep students out of the classroom and get them back where they belong. Thank you. Jane? Dan. Please state your name and address, and you have the microphone. Hi, this is Emily, actually Emily Barmanje, 2763 North 74th Street. Um, as a teacher in a different district, I would just like to commend the Medical Advisory Board um, for the efforts you are taking following the data, following the science, um, to keep both staff and students healthy. Um, I think it's really needs to be looked at um, about staff mental health as well. There's a big weight on your teachers. Um, and I think it can be overlooked by parents when you're asking teachers to manage a variety of different things in the classroom, um, including a Zoom call and maybe in-person students. So I just, I want to say that we support um, continuing the hybrid model in my house. Um, and we want to say thank you for all of your hard work. Um, Beth, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi, Beth Gino Mandel, 2620 North 63rd Street in Wauwatosa. Um, and my 
my point or question is, will the proposals for the model of learning be consistently approached based on the metrics, regardless of time? Or will the component of duration of time play a factor? Specifically, if measures are at today's level in March, do we not return to school? Despite our greatest hopes and aspirations, we may be unable to achieve the metrics that we've set forth. I tend to agree with the gentleman who shared how nearly impossible it may be to be green across the board. And my question is, will we accept a hybrid model for the entirety of the 2020-2021 school year? Or will there be a component of time? Will the decision tree change based on time? Will the metrics thresholds change? Or will they remain the way they are today? Thank you. Thank you. Um, did we have any more uh, in person? Or should Thank I just... Okay, Ali Gully, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi, my name is actually Jonathan Gooley. Um, I am uh, 2347 North 61st Street. And I do want to thank the medical panel very much for all of their hard work and thoughtfulness that goes into this. As someone who, like many parents, have probably been following the data ad nauseum, it has been very confusing to try to think of what is best for teachers, students, families, and the community at large. So I thank you very much. Um, I also, I think you already addressed this, but I thank you for updating that uh, scorecard more frequently, because as I'm looking at Tableau's data at the bottom of the scorecard today, we I think now are in the yellow for positivity rate. It's now reading at 5.9. So, you know, I, 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 I I'm advocating all the time trying to get children back into in-person learning. Ours are currently in TOSA Connected, and I think that there is a difference between the, the educational value potentially in, in class versus across a Zoom call. But that being said, I also feel like we have a responsibility to the greater community to make sure that we are not the source of spreading COVID. Um, as someone who cares for patients as they are dying, and that is my job. It is a really hard thing to 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 see. And I and I I heard another person comment a moment ago about their, you know, the the desire to try to get it back to five days of again in learning. I I would just question, I haven't really seen any data to say when is the district going to actually change towards a virtual completely. And 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 I realize that you have probably discussed this at nauseum and I apologize if I missed it. I know we have all been busy, but I thank you so very much because I do think that as time is going on, we are going to find um, this will probably get worse as the data are suggesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ann Ross, please state your name and address. You have the microphone. Thank you. Um, my name is Ann Ross and my address is 201 West Common Street Court in Glendale. Um, as a teacher in the district, first of all, I just want to thank the board members, the medical board, our administrators, not only at the district level, but at the levels in the schools. I think sometimes um, the amount of work that they're putting in isn't really recognized. Um, and I just have a couple of points. First of all, um, the comment that was made about us being overly restrictive, unless you're in the building doing the work with the kids, you can't possibly understand what it's like and how much as staff we appreciate that we don't consider it overly restrictive. This is data, this is science, and this is important. Um, we consider it to be smart and the safest way for those of us in the building, staff and students, um, to continue doing the work that we're doing. I just want to take you back to March when COVID hit and within a blink of an eye, we had to shift to a virtual learning environment with absolutely no warning and it was terrible. It was incredibly difficult 
And I truly believe that as a staff, we are preparing ourselves by building relationships with these students. When we talk about bridging the gap with our students um, that, that struggle, or if we wanna talk about equity, these relationships that we're building right now are paramount. That is what we do. Um, trust me, I don't know a single staff member that's jumping up and down saying, let's go virtual, that was awesome. None of us like that. None of us want yeah, any more that to be in the building full time with the students. So I just wanna say thank you for being cautious and using the data to drive your decisions that we feel as a staff, if you're looking at mental health, the smaller class sizes and the healthy staff, the healthy kids, that is where we need to be right now and where we need to continue to go until it's totally a different situation and safe for us to reopen full time. Thank you. Okay, next is Kendra Kovar. You have the mic. Please state your name and address. Kendra Kovar, 2405 Merlin Way, Brookfield. I'm a middle school teacher in the Wauwatosa School District, and I'm basically speaking in response to the woman who's talking about the two schools in Wauwatosa who are going five days a week. If Kendra, she Kendra, I'm going to ask that we really focus this only right now on specifically the presentation uh, that kind of our discussion of whether or not we're going to be in or not is agenda later. So let, I would really just ask you for others. I, I want to take one or two more, but it sounds like we're really what we want to talk about right now is the, the decision that we've got to make. And so I would ask that we really focus in on, again, the board, the presentation to the board. Okay, because I was just going to compare their metrics to ours. And That's their okay. metrics would be... Oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Um, did you want, I'm sorry, I just disabled Kendra's. Uh, if she wants to compare the metrics, I think that that's totally, relevant. that's totally relevant. Okay, sorry, Kendra, you're back, you're back on there. Okay, and it's, it's 30 seconds. The metrics in those two Catholic schools that she's referring to are equal to the hybrid that we're doing right now because their class sizes are so significantly small that they would match the hybrid we're currently using, and that's why I would say they're successful in staying in the hybrid. Like we are, their classes are hybrid size like ours. And that's all I got to say. Thank you. Okay, the next, next in line is uh, Zoe family. If you could state your name and address, you have the microphone. Thank you, good evening. My name is Paul Fuchs. I live at 4080 North 99th Street. Uh, I am calling on behalf of my partner and myself uh, and our daughter, who is a Madison Elementary student. Um, we support uh, the decision um, uh, being put forward by a recommendation being put forward by uh, the medical panel. We thank them for the hard work that they're doing. We appreciate the, uh, more, uh, the greater frequency of updates and, um, and I, I believe we're gonna hear later on uh, about uh, milestones. Um, so we look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, and I just wanted to, uh, in addition to thanking the medical panel and supporting their recommendation, uh, to thank um, uh, the teachers and staff at uh, all of our Wauwatosa schools. Um, they've been a real blessing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, Johnny, Johnny Schultz. You have the microphone, state your name and address, please. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. My name is Michael Gill. I live at 1519 South 53rd Street. I am a grandparent, uh, uh, support of a fourth grader at Roosevelt. We appreciate the distance learning option and all of the hard work by the teachers. A uh, little rocky start, but things seem to be going very well. We appreciate the ability to keep ourselves safe as we try to keep our bubble small and uh, keep everyone else safe. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I'm a fourth grader at Roosevelt too, so maybe we can. 
Next is Adam Cadlick. You have the microphone. Please unmute. State your name and address. Sorry, uh, Adam Cadlick, 1639 Alta Vista Avenue. My comment is, um, I, th I think the, the decision that the board needs to make is um, whether the medical advisory panel has made an appropriate recommendation. And as medical professionals, uh, the job is to weigh the potential harms and the potential benefits. And um, we're gonna hear from a lot of people about that they support it, a lot of people that they don't support it. As a professional, your job is to weigh, weigh the evidence. When I listened to the report, um, I heard a lot of hypotheticals. I heard a lot of um, statements that didn't have any numbers behind them. And I know that there are numbers. Uh, I didn't hear um, much about the practical harms that we know are happening. While there are people that are pleased with virtual, there are people who are very displeased with it. Um, there are families that are suffering. There are parents who are suffering. There are children who are suffering. And um, I think those potential harms, those known harms need to enter the conversation. Um, I've, I've, I've just heard, I've, I think I heard a pattern of what I would call hypothetical or theoretical concerns, and they may be founded and they may be grounded in data, but there are also concerns that are, are happening. Um, at some point, the medical advisory board's gonna need to make a decision, and they're gonna need to make a decision about whether or not people have the option, the choice <clears throat> um, to have a five-person school week. There's a choice right now for a totally virtual school week, and many people are doing that because it works for them and their families. There's no choice for in-person learning in Wauwatosa schools right now, five days a week, and there are its surrounding communities. <clears throat> the board needs to look at this recommendation and determine, and I'm, it's not an easy job, but determine, do the benefits outweigh the harms? Thank you. Okay, uh, next is Vanessa and Tyson. You have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi, Tyson Miller, 9322 Beverly Place. Um, I just have a quick question about the data that you guys are referring to. All I'm wondering is, is that available? Will you make that available so that we can, as taxpayers, review that ourselves? Or is that something that you're using for yourselves? Tyson, I can answer this question for you and for everyone in the community. The data is available on our district website. Um, it's pulled directly. Um, Mr. Rowland has it up. Uh, on his phone right now. I can see a little, little dot of him uh, on Zoom, uh, but it's all available. Uh, you can actually sign up for uh, both the scorecards. You can see them and that's what they were saying that they would update. It's also pulled down on a daily basis where you can actually get it pushed to you. So again, uh, everybody in the community, I would encourage you to uh, swing over to the Wauwatosa School District website while you're watching this um, presentation uh, this evening and sign up to get everything pushed out to you and uh, you'll be able to go in, check what's happening at your kid's school in terms of uh, positive cases, quarantines, as well as all the data. Uh, Michelle Anderson, who is a crack uh, data analyst, has set everything up so that it's easy to read, understand, review, and that's the metrics and data that the uh, advisory committee is looking at. And I, I would say really good information there uh, and it looks at where all of our students and staff are coming from. Um, so it's good information. Uh, for anyone who's interested, I'll push the link into the chat panel for Zoom as well. Jamie, you're the best. Uh, Deb Falk, Alec, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Good evening, everyone. This is Deb Falk, Palak, 7435 West Wells Street. Um, thank you very much to the medical advisory panel for all of the work you're doing. Um, and I am commenting, uh, Mr. Meyer brought up about groups experiencing achievement gaps, and I appreciate his comment 
and I appreciate Dr. Uh, Brimeyer. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, okay, wonderful. Um, your response, and certainly when we talk about those groups, one of those groups um, would would be our students with disabilities. I also, I'm very thankful for uh, Dr. Ertel for your response to me today regarding asking the medical advisory panel about a plan um, implemented for our students with disabilities and to bring that forward to that panel. So thank you, Dr. Ertel, for that. Um, certainly, we, we are experiencing differences. Um, we are in the cohort uh, model, the phase into learning. Um, we have not re we've received zero instructional minutes in math um, this entire month thus far. But, but for, for, the, for anything involving kind of the decision in terms of the boards and stuff, can we save those items until the next agenda item? Yes, um, certainly. Thank you, Dr. Jessup Binger. So um, basically, I do appreciate the efforts to look at groups with achievement gaps, look at a alternate plan that's been implemented for our students with disabilities. And I certainly would value the input of your panel. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. Jamie, how many other hands do we have raised? Um, zero. Outstanding. Um, I was getting the itchy to move this forward. Thank you all very much for your comments. Um, on that item. Um, I, I want to close out by saying before I come back to the school board members, just see if there's any follow-up points or questions, but I want to make uh, a big thank you to um, our medical advisory board members who are here. Um, you answered the phone when I literally called the summer, uh, and many other folks from the district called different, we were calling different folks, uh, and kind of answered the call and when we said we need kind of your expertise and guidance uh, for you to sit down with colleagues um, and to provide as much thoughtful guidance as you can. Uh, ultimately, these decisions are the board's two-way with your recommendation, but gosh, I am incredibly indebted to your expertise where we do not have it uh, in terms of uh, what the community spread looks like uh, from developing the metrics to thinking so thoughtfully. Um, what, what I feel like I've taken away is that we can come into any situation with a plan. Uh, and then the pandemic happens, and we've got to be flexible. Uh, and we've got to be consistent with our missions and values as a district and how we navigate all this. Um, and I really appreciate you providing a lens uh, from a medical, public health, mental health perspective uh, that keeps us focused on those specific things as we navigate this uh, together as a board. So thank you so much. Um, to my board colleagues, other questions or comments that you have? Um, for um, the, the presenters this evening. Seeing none, um, thank you both. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, Dr. Jessabanger. Um, I did have a question. Um, so I know that while I'm in school, like as of right now, I see people wearing masks and I also know that a lot of my peers outside of school are not socially distancing. So um, is there a possibility that we could create um, possibly like a presentation using our metrics, showing um, students the importance of keeping our community rates low and, and um, making sure that especially high school students who can drive and go places on their own, understand the importance of them making their own decisions of um, wearing a mask and being safe. So. It's a great suggestion, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, we are going to resume our agenda as originally published this evening, moving into superintendent action items. Uh, this is the approval of recommendation to stay in current education model until December 1st, 2020, as discussed at the board in service. Um, 
Yeah. It is recommended that the school board approve the school district stay in the current model of instruction hybrid for the phase into learning option. Planning and preparation for return to the classroom learning option beginning November 24th, 2020 is authorized. Thus, the earliest change to the phase into learning model of instruction to the classroom learning model would be December 1st, 2020. Return to the classroom learning model must be approved by school board resolution prior to the return date. To planning and preparation for the virtual learning option is authorized. The superintendent in consultation with the medical public health advisory committee is authorized to shift to exclusively virtual instruction because of worsening metrics in Wauwatosa. Approval of the school board is not required for shift to virtual instruction and I so move. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Gilman. Tim, could you get the Thank you. So the recommendation that we have is based on the number of factors and the number of components. And I think we can all just heard a significant portion of that that plays into our obvious decision making related to um, how we can carry out school. I'm just going to walk through uh, some of those points and make a few comments about why we're recommending this, um, some of the managerial and administrative type uh, reasons as well. You can see this is a chart um, that was discussed somewhat previously related to our COVID metrics. That's right from our website. So that's the information that people have access to on a daily basis. Um, this next one shows, this has been updated today, and we can see we have 13 staff members right now and 55 students in quarantine. Um, those are not, most of those have not been verified whether they're positive or, or not if they've been tested. And I'm not going to get into discussing the medical issues, but the reality remains we have 13 staff and 55 students quarantined right now. This is the metric that we were again talking about earlier a little bit. Um, you can see there's, and I believe we're going to be moving into the yellow on um, positivity rate. These numbers, I think it's important for people to understand, these metrics were devised. So for example, um, one second. For example, it's taken into consideration the fact that our student population, 81% um, of our students, uh, overall 80 elementary, 81% overall, 84% are our TOSA students and the rest from other areas around Milwaukee, around Wauwatosa, including Milwaukee. And that's taken into account in the data. For our staff, 28%. Um, make sure I have this accurate. 28% of our employees live in Wauwatosa. And it's roughly 900 employees. The rest are from a number of areas all the way up to Winnebago County, Manitowoc County, Racine County, um, Washa County, significant portion. So that's taken into account with the all of the metrics. And I just think it's important that um, people understand that as well. So it's not just Wauwatosa. Um, and I think another important, important point is that to do school, we need staff and we need teachers. And that's an important, important component. Um, to the whole equation of what we're able to do and how we're able to manage that in the school system. So speaking of staff, one of the things we did recently is uh, put out a thought exchange. And a thought exchange essentially is a survey that people respond to a prompt. And then uh, they go back in and they, they star those responses, which ultimately gives us a determination of what's most important to, and in this case, it's this question, reflecting on the past few months what topics are at the top of your heart and mind? What has worked well? Um, and where can we improve? So in getting sorry. 
sorry, in getting staff feedback, um, we did get 565 people responding to the thought exchange, 887 thoughts, and 43,000 ratings. By far, our, our most active thought exchange we've done in three years. Um, and just the three key points I came across, fully in person, um, and basically it's why has the board been discussing this? We're not ready. My classroom could not fit all my students safely. Uh, second, the second highest rated thought was I'm working hard to keep my students socially distanced. So that's been a big issue. And then I'm worried that we'll move, move five days a week too quickly. So there's been a lot of concerns presented by our teachers, by our staff, and by our building principals as well about shifting, um, in particular, a lot of social distancing. And the reality is with that the recommendations of keeping students six feet away is not going to happen. In some cases right now, it's, it's not happening. So I think that's just not a reality with social distancing. But um, for the most part, throughout most of the day right now in a hybrid model, we are able to keep people at um, social distance, physically distanced, um, to the best of our ability. And I think these are the things that were mentioned by our, I don't need to go over this again, by our medical advisory. Um, I think here is the point, a couple of points that I'd like to make that in particular, why we're recommending this. COVID cases continue to climb in Wauwatosa and areas where our students and staff live. Um, that's just the reality. And, you know, I, I think, um, again, it was discussed through our medical advisory committee, but we see it continuing to go up on a, on a, a weekly basis. And when, you know, um, I, it, it just has an impact on, on how we, there's, a, there's a, a mental impact, there's obviously the physical impact of, of COVID and what impact that has in our community as well. With all students, I mentioned this, in school five days a week, we will not be able to space all students six feet apart. Um, social distancing, during non classroom times will continue to be a challenge, which they are now. The schools that, you know, I, I, it's interesting because you get a lot of emails, and no matter what, most people are, are going to debate and argue and say we should be in school five days a week because I believe we should be in virtual. Um, and certainly others that I believe we should be staying in a hybrid. I always hear the arguments that, well, all these other places are doing it so well and there's no problems. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't think a lot of other people have conversations with the school administrators or superintendents in these other districts and to realize that it's not without problems. Um, every district has, has a challenge with it and every district has some success. Every district is having some unsuccessful opportunities, whether they're fully in person um, or they're in, they're in hybrid. There's a, a lot of school districts in our state right now that are um, on the edge of going full virtual because of the number of cases and COVID in their communities and in their schools. Um, so here's the, I, I think there's been mixed feedback on hybrid, we've heard a little bit tonight, but um, it, it's a work in progress, like everything else we're doing right now, it's open to change. Um, but there's been a lot of positive feedback, and in particular from our staff. I think you heard a couple of teachers during comment uh, this evening talking about the relationships they've been able to build with students and education is a relationship business and they have, uh, I had a discussion with the teacher today saying how positive it's been and their ability to create those relationships and feel like they can get into deeper and quicker learning with their students. Um, I don't think we have any evidence of that, but if we listen to the people that are working with the kids, um, they feel pretty strong about the fact that they're able to make connections. And again, that's not everybody, but uh, overall anecdotal evidence to me or anecdotal feedback is they feel like they can really make some money with, with being in the hybrid. Um, we have increasing cases in schools. Right now we have more students, uh, more staff in quarantine than we've ever had, and it's continuing to go up. So while a lot of my time is spent trying to figure out how we can get back to five days a week right now, the reality is we're working to stay on a virtual. Um, for the past five days from Underwood Elementary School, we've been trying to figure out how we don't shift to virtual. And we'll have that discussion again tomorrow morning and find a way to, you know, we have eight staff members. 
and students quarantine as well. But again, I think people need to understand if we don't have teachers um, and adults able to be in buildings, our sub pool and every every sub pool in the state of Wisconsin right now is very shallow. There's not a lot of substitute teachers. And if we can't have our teachers be safe um, and have them get in quarantine, we can't run school, whether we're in hybrid or not. Um, but certainly not in person five days a week. I think that's a lot of, I think, I know that's a lot of the challenges that other districts are facing that are either in hybrid or in, in five days a week. Um, so those are some things that are taken into account. We're looking at, the reason we're looking at December 1st is the end of the trimester, which is what we've talked about for allowing people to switch um, from models of instruction, switch between the models of instruction is November 23rd, which is a Monday, and Tuesday is right before Thanksgiving break. It would only make sense to not start students new on that Tuesday and shift it to December 1st. This gives us time to further um, develop what five days a week will look like for all three models that we have and make sure that we can um, test that out. I think even, even when we get to the point for decision making, that that's going to be a challenge because we don't know how many students will, will make that shift, but we're going to have a model created that people will be able to make a decision, um, a, a good solid decision on. I think we'll be able to do that within the timelines that the board had suggested at the last meeting um, and having something for the board to vote on in the first meeting in November and sharing the second meeting in October, second school board meeting. So here's the recommendation written again, and we have a proposed timeline that you would be able to um, access some of the information and basically what I suggested about the selection window for when parents be able to go through and select a different course of study all the way up, all the way up to December 1st. But again, that is not, I think it's important to point out that if COVID, the COVID environment is not the place um, that we feel we can be successful in our schools and as we continue to learn more about COVID and uh, moves through schools and around schools and work with our health department and our medical advisory committee, that's not for sure that I'm not gonna say that we would recommend it at December 1st that we would go to five days a week. I think that's been our stated goal from the start, um, but we're not gonna do it carelessly or um, I think trying to take as much into consideration as we can and try to keep schools open. I think the worst thing that would happen right now is we would have to shift to full virtual. I just don't think that's where we want to go. So we're going to continue to fight to keep our schools open and hybrid and do everything we can from shifting building subs, which is what we're doing right now over at Underwood to help staff that building um, for the next several days. And we'll, we'll see how that goes. But it's Underwood now, it'll be another building. Um, so we're, we're that seems to be jumping around from building to building. We've had challenges at Longfellow, we've had challenges at Lincoln, we've had challenges now at Underwood. Um, and maybe, maybe that's, that's going to be the ongoing challenge, but um, we, we are trying to avoid getting into the virtual model. So I did want to point out if we do end up going into virtual, we are going to be prepared and we are prepared for, for shifting to that as, I think when you look at the recommendation that the, the reason for that recommendation, because if we do shift, it's not going to be a quick, or it is going to be a quick change to virtual. Something has occurred where it could be the morning of a situation where all of a sudden we have teachers that call in sick and are not able to staff a school and we would have to, um, we would have to cancel school and go virtual. There's other times where if the COVID environment gets to a point in a building that we can't maintain um, with staff and with students over a period of 14 days, that we have to close for several weeks. But as a district, if we shift fully, if we end up having to get to the situation where we shift fully virtual, where it's, whether it's the state um, that comes through and closes schools, we will be pre prepared for that. Um, we have JK through 12 virtual learning guidelines, daily schedules for each grade level, uh, and the Zoom link will be published on the front page of, of Canvas. Principals are currently reviewing that this week with their staff and we'll be communicating about what that would look like to families this week as well. 
And that is the uh, kind of presentation. The recommendation I think is pretty self-explanatory. Um, what we're recommending stands in high risk. Is that Questions or comments from the board? I can go, I guess. <laughs> uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, and thank you right to the panel who went earlier and thank you to the district for just trying to continue to uh, patch this tough year together. Um, I know it's hard. So thank you for the continued work on that. Uh, I guess the, the question I've got is the, um, the conversation that we had the last meeting um, and then the the bubble that we didn't click in the presentation related to the timeline um, in regards to when the TOSA connected like final plan will be presented. Cause I know besides the TOSA connected parents, I'm sure there will be all sorts of phase into learning parents who will be um, excited to see that fully developed and ready to go. So we can all feel confident in um, the move, um, well, at least more confident in a move at some point, potentially, maybe. Um, so I guess as we look at the timeline, I know I had raised some suggestions, uh, you know, adding other board meetings, you know, when would that presentation happen? Um, how, how could that happen faster? Um, to, to maybe even and if that plan is ready to go and the metrics are ready to go, maybe I could even get comfortable with an earlier date than December 1st, just throwing that out there. But where is that and how are we shifting this timeline, if any, um, to give us the time to react to that plan so it's not just push button go? So what I mentioned was um, second meeting in October we bring to the board we would vote on the, the following meeting. So it would give several weeks. Um, but to have it prepared before that, we will not. We put a timeline administratively in place to work um, to get everything organized to bring to the board at that point in time to um to look at those connected and the shift in the phase of the learning or fourth phase of the learning. We've got to prepare multiple scenarios about, again, again, not knowing how many people are going to switch, switch modes, but we wouldn't be ready. I'm not going to say we would if something were to happen, but I, I mean, the timeline that we suggested is what we need to be able to accomplish it. Anything going any faster, we're going to miss things and um, I don't want to put anybody in that situation. That makes sense. It's does so we're going to vote on the 9th of november potentially right we would hear the presentation on the 26th then we would come back and people would vote on it on the 9th and then it sounds like the window at least based on what i'm bringing the window for elementary parent selection for how what they would choose would begin the next day and would be open through the following Friday, right? Or are we saying that people would have the ability to choose through December 1? I guess at what point does that window close for those parents? And are we giving them enough time to, to know what they're choosing? Again, right, we've already kind of done the like, we had a plan, people chose, and then we kind of moved it around a little bit on them. So I want to make sure that to the extent that we can avoid that again this time, we avoid it. Yeah, that's why we're taking the time and trying to give us enough time to be able to do it. Um, I think we can communicate well enough if the longer you open the window. And the question, I guess, remains how much time do people need to make decisions. Um, you know, if we communicate well enough, we would hope that they're able to make the decision and if we communicate early enough. So if we're communicating on October 28th, and we get that information out to people, whether the board votes on, or we'll be voting on it, but I think we can get the plan out so they clearly understand what it is. Um, and, you know, timing's not ideal on anything this year, nothing. 
we're just trying to figure it out and do the best we can to, to compress it. I would hate to extend it longer just to make sure that like they have a longer window, but once people make those decisions, then we have to implement and create um, and, and place people across the buildings and create sections and all this, because that's dependent upon the number of people as well. Yeah, I guess, I, you know, I just throw it out there just to keep in our back pocket that if we have, um, you know, a decent amount of feedback, that's going to take uh, some time or might shift it meaningfully, um, then we might just want to agenda another meeting somewhere in between the 26th and the 9th just to talk through those changes. Can we implement them? Um, and just to be flexible to that. So then, again, to your point, we have the time to even communicate the you know newly created plan that we would vote on on the ninth. Um, I just want to make sure that there's enough time there. Sean, do you have any family birthdays that week? <laughs> Not, I don't believe so. My dad's is October 31st, but. Uh, <laughs> so we made plan for. I think that's a weekend. The 31st is a Saturday. The, um, seems perfect. perfect. For Thank you. All kidding aside, um, I do like your idea, Sean, of having a meeting in between, uh, just even if it's somewhat in service like to be able to ask questions so that when we make the decision on the ninth, it's really like the final final. Um, the other recommendation that I would have only if this is possible, because I don't want school staff to be working over Thanksgiving weekend. They're working every weekend as it is right now, it seems like. Um, but ideally, I'd like parents to have a weekend before they have to make their commitment. So if, if we're making our decision on the 9th and it goes out the 10th, is it being returned by the 16th enough time to get people in, like to, the, to have the new plan in time for the first? Like, I, I sort of feel like we need to back it out, like by when teachers need to know their new classes, by when do principals have to communicate that to teachers, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, and that's what we did. That's how we created. We went backward from from December first and worked our way back and said, when would things? But that didn't include a weekend, did it, for parents to decide? I think I remembered it. It was that we decided we voted on the ninth, and then they had like the tenth through the thirteenth. And the only reason I yeah. raise it is I feel like we've gotten that piece of feedback before that folks are like, life is crazy during the week. And, you know, I only sort of get to talk to my spouse once the kids are in bed Friday night and, you know, I can grieve after work. So I don't know if that's a possibility, even if we gave folks until the end of day Saturday, just something to consider. I just want to make sure we're taking the feedback we're getting from the community as much as we can, also recognizing that to your point, every calendar option stinks. That's why I think the extra meeting might be a good idea, Sean. I would agree if we get our parents on the weekend, at least one weekend day, that's very true. Week weeks are really difficult these days for everyone, I'm sure. Do you need a fourth for the majority? Because <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> So I think what we've decided is December 30th or October 31st we'll be meeting um, to try to hit every birthday. I mean, there's no trick or treating this year anyway, probably. So why not? Oh, that's that's outside the scope of the school board. <laughs> it is. Don't let anybody think it is. I will. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at possibly adjusting meetings. Um, I, I think two things that really resonated with me: uh, giving families a uh, a Saturday. To, to contemplate uh, whatever we can do to make sure that we're um, protecting the Thanksgiving holiday uh, weekend so that staff are not working, um, I think is, is, is essential too. And so if we need to have a, a closer number of meetings that happen where we make it, we've got a, a meeting in service and a meeting in the same week, um, the board, we can figure out how to make that happen. It'll give a little bit less time for us to consider it, but I thought it was real and real and real so we crank that out. Um, building time for feedback. Um, I, I'd rather us be rushed than have families or the district be rushed. 
Um, I also like that idea because uh, it, it's a great time to talk directly with the staff. And I felt that the in service that we had, the prior uh, in service, was very helpful. Um, I realized that the public uh, doesn't generally comment at those meetings. Uh, we, we may want to make an exception for that, but it really does help us talk through the different options and hear directly from the staff, from the staff as a whole board. And I, and I really like that. Can I just make one comment or clarification? When we're saying we're voting on that day, we don't know yet that we're voting to we come back by day in person again. We're still not deciding that that's the vote we're going to take yet, are we? I mean, we're still thinking. Right. still based on metrics and we have enough teachers and all that kind of stuff so yeah. i don't want the, the yeah, I don't author to say oh we're going to vote on we're going to be back five day in person this more first we, we have no idea what we're going to be voting on at that point it might be a recommendation just like tonight it might be a recommendation to be virtual it might be a recommendation to be five day in person we, we don't know that yet. is that correct i'm very sure. I'm, i just want to follow up on that so what i understand is happening is the 26th of October. We're going to hear more about the decisions on TOSA Connected, how TOSA Connected fits in with uh, phase into learning and the choices and staffing and how all that will work. Uh, at that time, I'm wondering if you'll be adjusting the timeline to keep in the third trimester or take it off, but that's a side note. Then what we're giving direction tonight on is having a meeting in between the 26th and the first meeting in November with any kind of recommendation so that we have full time to discuss and hear from staff. That's the way I look at it. That's correct. Um, we can also take a look at um, opportunities for submitting feedback. Um, there's a variety of different things that we can talk about over time. Uh, so do we want to kind of create a feedback portal down the there if they want to do kind of, uh, stuff? We'll have uh, surveys that we'll have in here that are being collected in terms of people's perceptions and experiences. We'll also have later on top of that the medical public health advisory recommendation. So I think there'll be a variety of that uh, kind of come from outside of the recommendation. Um, so, Dr. Lomar, I just thought about what the board consideration timeline would look like and what things we need. Uh, we want to make sure that the board has everything that we need uh, between the 26th and the 9th to feel that we are making the best possible decision for the So, it may be some additional meetings, some additional information that we have. Whatever that may be like. Um, feel free kind of now or at the bottom of the meeting or next couple of weeks to check in with me by we can send a phone call, we can shoot an email, kind of anything that you feel like here's some stuff that I want to make. Um, we'll build that in the, the process and timeline and we'll make sure I speak to the committees that are focused on when we're talking about what we need to do in the for the conversation. Yeah, and I guess just to build on that, I guess what I would say is to the extent that the board can feel like 99% locked in by November 2nd, let's say, um, because then that gives you, um, Dr. Wright, the, the time to begin promoting what is, you know, the most likely close to baked plan, right, um, as opposed to you know, promoting something that's either not 100% baked or not 99% baked or just promoting it, you know, the evening, whenever we vote on it, November 9th. I just want to make sure that we give people time and that whatever we're promoting is as accurate as we can. Sean, any other questions or comments? There's no hands raised. Anything else from board members and questions and comments?
Uh, we do have one community member hand raised. Oh, I think we're, Jamie, we're not quite ready to go. Okay. Sorry, my mistake. I'm going to guess it's going to be lots of um, for the board and the not, so not on the recommendation. I do have some questions for follow-up that will bring us to the October 26th recommendation. I don't think now's the time, but um, I think we've gotten a number of emails and there was a couple of comments tonight that I raised some, that for me raised some questions that I'm going to wrestle with a little bit, and so I'll just put them in an email. And I would encourage other board members to do the same so that you all feel like what you're building to for October 26th is like you know where the board is struggling. Um, before we hop into community comments, do we want to take a quick um, Break going with community comment being one for some amount of time. Take a five minute recess, come back for community comments, uh, listen to all of it, and call. Okay. So I'm going to pause for a five minute recess right now. Uh, we will be back at 8 50. Uh, we will then um, take for community comments and um, take a minute. Um, we are going to launch into uh, community comments. Uh, a reminder again, community comments is a really great time to advocate and share perspectives. Uh, we are not able to do a question and answer. Um, when you hop on, please uh, share your name and your address. Uh, and rem a reminder that everyone is limited, unfortunately, so we can get to as many uh, perspectives and voices as possible to no more than three minutes. Um, Jamie, if you want to roll through uh, everybody who we have uh, with hands raised uh, virtually. Uh, we have no hands raised, so uh, we can go home. No attendees, hands raised. We have one, Tad Schrader. Tad Schrader, please state your name and address, and you have the microphone. Good evening, Tad Schrader, 2556 North 84th Street. It is, yeah, it's getting late. Sorry about my question. Uh, so did you say it was not a question answer or just a comment? It is just comment. Just comment. Okay. I was, I was just commenting. I was getting a little confused on the, the POSA Connect and the ability to have a, a, another, another meeting. Um, is, is that because, I guess my comment is, are we, are we hedging on not having another meeting because POSA Connect is that fully – fully uh, staffed or, or, you know, what was, I guess the big debate there is I was trying to figure out. It seemed like there was a, a little confusion. No, in, in that I can, uh, can see why you and others, and I will answer that one for the community uh, for kind of process purposes. So the board uh, generally meets every other week, uh, the second and fourth Monday of the month. Uh, what we were talking about is adding some additional meetings in to make sure that the board had ample opportunity uh, to hear from the district leadership as well as provide feedback. So that when, um, usually for each board meeting, something is presented in one meeting and then it is voted on in the, the next meeting. Uh, and this would give us an opportunity in between those meetings to meet one or more times to make sure that there's kind of a back and forth. To make okay. sure at the point when it comes back to us uh, on November 9th, for a vote uh, that we have all of our questions and concerns answered um, in kind of in that window of time. Thank you. Deb Falk Palak, you have the mic. Please state your name and address. Thank you, Deb Falk Palak, seventy four thirty five West Twelfth Street. Um, just following up about, do we feel we have enough special education teachers, people with that specialty, to be working with students across these different models? Um, as I mentioned, um, we are in the phase into learning, um, and we have not had math instruction per our IEP um, on our days that we're not at school yet. 
So I'm concerned about that. And I know we, um, at the last board meeting, I think it was brought up that there's um, been, there's starting to be training to train our assistants in the district on providing reading and math instruction. Um, so part of me wonders, have we talked to our special ed staff, you know, the teachers, have we asked them, um, I'm getting emails from our teacher over the weekend, late at night, and I'm sure people across the district are, are, and teachers are doing that. That's just the way that they are, committed staff individuals. But have we talked to our staff, um, and reading and math to me are essential subjects to have taught by a certified licensed teacher who's qualified to be teaching those things. So that is, that's a concern of mine. And can we potentially look at that, look at ideas on how to do it? Again, possibly grouping students. So it, in my, I don't feel I need one-on-one -on -one help on that per se in a Zoom meeting, but um, there are ways I think that we can start to look at doing this differently and ensuring our students have equal access to qualified staff to be teaching these critical, critical skills. And that is how achievement gaps continue to get closed and that we don't widen them. So thank you for listening to the comments. And I would love to really talk to those people that are in the classroom, our teachers, our assistants, and see what do they need um, and what are their thoughts and ideas. So thank you. Hey, Stephanie Z. You have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi, my name is Stephanie Zuli. My address is 2171 North 65th Street. And my comment is just um, in the beginning, it seemed as, as though the recommendations were um, due to um, basically the community, etc. cetera. Um, but then as we went on, and I, I may be misunderstanding, but it seems like we are pushing it out because we are basically not ready to open um, for five days. Now, it w I don't know if that was only for TOSA Connected or for the entire school, um, but it just seemed to me like the reasoning turned more to we're, we're just simply not ready to open by that date and we're just pushing it out because of that. Stephanie, I think it's a combination of uh, both. Um, I think what we're hearing is that our metrics and data is getting worse, uh, we're headed in the wrong direction. Um, we are worse now than we've been when we're looking at the data uh, since at any point the district has been tracking that and sharing with the community. We also have significant challenges within our schools. Uh, and our goal right now is Dr. Erdl, what I, what I took from Dr. Erdl's presentation is uh, we are trying to stay open and hybrid uh, and not move into virtual, uh, and that's really where, where we're at right now. Uh, so our schools, as well as every other school, kind of provides challenges. Um, and we're, I also kind of, I also heard a summary of, we have lar larger numbers of uh, students in staff in quarantine right now, so we're trying to navigate that and the complexity of that. Um, but I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, we've got dual challenges going on right now. Uh, one, Medical advisory bot um, group, I heard say, uh, yep, we do not have data that would indicate that it would be uh, safe and advantageous to open schools. And we're hearing from our district staff operationally, there's significant challenges in doing that, uh, no matter what our uh, medical advisory bot is saying. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Kevin Deval. You have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Kevin Duvall, 1856 North 71st Street. I just wanted to make a comment about shifting criteria for going to five days a week. Uh, it seems that originally it was all about the data. I'm hearing a lot of criteria that should have no bearing on the decision, such as Oh, the teachers like the smaller class size because they get more one-on-one -on -one time with children or, well, not opening until December 1st will give us more time to test our technology. 
uh, those that criteria should have no bearing on what the normal state of affairs is, which is five days a week in-person learning. It should be a purely database decision. Uh, if my house burns down, I might not have to do the dishes, and that's nice, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to move into a new home. So let's not use criteria uh, that might be an outcome of not having kids in school the whole time uh, to to push us uh, one decision or another. That's it. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate the memo. Stephanie Z, you have the microphone. State your name and address. Um, I actually just spoke, so thank you. And we have no more hands raised. Oh, wait, one more. Sorry, one. Someone just put their hand up. Uh, Beth, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi, thank you. Beth Gino Mandel, 2620 North 63rd Street. Thanks for taking my comment again. I'd like to advocate for what I believe is a missing piece in our criteria for five day education. Um, I'd like to ask the question, who's responsible as a part of the medical health panel's assessment for identifying, collating, researching, and quantifying the mental and social impacts that occur based on reduced in-person education for our children and for our families. Who will model this out and project the impacts on the scale of weeks, months, a year, particularly for the early educational years? How will this be weighed and assessed in subsequent decision periods? If we're not using it today, fine, but when will it be a part of the decision? I believe these factors are not being given the attention they deserve. If part of a more comprehensive analysis, I also believe it would drive us to be more creative in our solutions to the problems that we are facing, such as staff shortages. Thank you. Beth, thanks for your comments. I think uh, one, of the, one of the things I would like to add is that we do, um, have a substantial value for the socio-emotional, mental health, and well-being uh, of students um, in these decision making. It's actually why we have multiple uh, individuals who are psychologists, uh, regular children, uh, who are uh, on the advisory body, one of whom, Chastity, uh, Dr. Vermeer, uh, who spoke today, as well as Dr. Jenny Howe, who uh, has spoken previously. So uh, while I think uh, what you are articulating is of the utmost importance, uh, gosh, that research and that assessment uh, is darn, darn difficult to do in um, the midst of the first global pandemic in 100 years. Uh, but it's certainly something we have our eyes on and something that we value a great deal in making sure that we uh, are taken very seriously. Pete? Lakatos, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi, my name's Pete Lakatosh. I'm at 2542 North 111th Street. And I just want to say, it, to support the conversation that happened this evening, I've, I've heard several times the board, mem board members in the same meeting ask for extra meetings, but have it not be followed up on it. Tonight was, I think, the first time I've heard fairly, you know, a, a rather positive response to, yes, let's do this, let's do this. And I, I, what I'm hearing is a very, a great set of learned lessons from the previous set of plans that Dr. Ergo gave us earlier in the summer about getting us to where we're at now and learning those lessons to where we're at here. So I really am very grateful for that. So thank you very much. And, and actually on that topic of TOSA Connect, I'm very glad to hear we're currently WVA families. And so we are very interested to hear how TOSA Connect would look going forward, pending that decision coming up, if it is just for one trimester or, or you know, possibly for the rest of the year. So thank you for taking that, kind of taking that baton and running with it about exploring TOSA Connect and what five days will look like as well to, to give us a more, I mean, as best you can, but to give us a more fleshed out plan as opposed to what very much felt like choosing blind last time to having maybe choosing 
less blind with some dimly lit candles would be great. So it's, it's, you know, one of the things made what comments made was about how much time do parents need to choose? And Dr. Earl at one point earlier, months ago had said, you know, most parents know where they are. And that was true for us. We knew, we knew right then where we are, but we were also choosing from two different choices that didn't have any information for us. So the time I may need, my family may need to make that choice may be relatively short. So that's not the issue for us. The issue more so is how much information can you give us? How much of a plan or even an outline can you give us of what we're choosing? It's so how long do I need to choose? Giving, giving families a day who are working and both parents working, one parent, work, whoever, caregivers are both working, giving that day off where they can even find some time to think and reflect with each other or with other family members is important. Um, but, and, I've, and I totally agree with that, but give something to reflect on, which is what that conversation was about. So thank you for picking that up, going with it and showing such enthusiasm on really exploring the option before it comes down to the vote and having a presentation where then we're all learning about it at the exact same moment and including the board and, and everybody and we're still choosing a little blind so thank you i really appreciate all of the progress and the changes and the development that the board the staff and the district are really showing over these months as this has gone on through however we're gonna how whatever that you want to end up putting down for this adjectives of pandemic and all the rest but so thank you very much for everything and thank you for your constant commitment to all the different groups yeah. Jump up loop again, still at 772 North 116th Street. Dr. Earl, ladies and gentlemen of the board, let me be perfectly clear. The primary job of both the district and this board is the education of the students in this district. By keeping them out of school for even a remaining additional day, we are not doing our jobs. Are we to truly believe that? that by waiting until December, things are going to change so that we are prepared to possibly bring them back five days a week. It seems like the district at this point in time is actually preparing to go the opposite direction and go virtual and is preparing us for that reality. We should be looking at ways to get the kids back in school. If we believe for one second that we are not affecting both educational, emotional, and social well-being of the students by keeping them out of school, we are kidding ourselves. We need to do everything in our power to get them back in school. To solve all the problems discussed tonight, the board needs to do one thing. It needs to reject the school district's request for continuing the hybrid model through into the summer. The district had previously outlined a date of October 5th as the possibility of going back to five days a week if the metrics still allowed it. We are going to play those metrics to keep us in the hybrid model. The district should have been well prepared by this point in time to go to that model if the metrics had allowed us to do so. By continuing this, we are just pushing off the inevitable. The board to do its job needs to tonight simply reject the decision to continue and should mandate that we continue looking quickly at going back to school five days a week for both the social, emotional, and educational well-being of the students that will help support the school district which is the primary responsibility of both the district and the board. It is not our responsibility as either district or board to act as the health department to mitigate the pandemic that is then if the things got out of hands, the health department would take control and take care of that. Our responsibility is to the, the educational uh, needs of the students of this district, and we have a responsibility to fill it. Let's do this now. Okay, Caroline Jankowski, you have the microphone. Hi, this is Caroline Jankowski, 1310 North 63rd Court, Wauwatosa. Um, I, I know this isn't meant to be a question time, but I, I could not understand during the meeting to understand the rationale for pushing the decision to reevaluate the opportunity for the kids to come back sooner all the way to December 1st. What I thought I heard is that it's really based more on giving the district more time to work through the 
TOSA connected option than it having anything to do with the metrics. Um, and it wasn't explained in the presentation. Dr. Ertl mentioned it briefly, but honestly, sometimes also just for feedback for future meetings, it's often really hard to hear the people that are in the big room together. Everyone who's at home and participating, calling in separately, we can hear them very well, but for the rest of you, it's really hard to understand or hear what you're saying. So I know this isn't supposed to be a question and answer, but that's one of the things where I think as a parent, I, I feel as if the, there hasn't been a lot of transparency on what the approach is or that there's been a shift. And I understand this is, this is an organic evergreen situation and no one's kind of charted through these waters. And so there has to be an element of being flexible and understanding that plans are gonna shift. And one thing that we commit to a month ago may not be possible going forward. Um, but it feels a little bit like you're kind of just avoiding discussing, discussing that. And if it's really just, hey, we need to give TOSA Connected more time, come out and say it. And maybe you did, again, I didn't hear it. But as a parent who's really hoping their kids could be at school five days a week, it feels like uh, we just pushed off that option because we can't get this semi-virtual option to work, which is frustrating. Or when they talk about how we don't have enough staff, it feels as if, well, maybe if we weren't dedicating so much staff to, to staffing the TOSA Connected option, we'd have the opportunity to have more staff available to have the kids in school. Um, and so I guess if you could just explain that December 1st date rationale. Um, I know from discussions with a lot of parents who weren't able to participate in the meeting tonight, that was a question, that was one of the biggest questions that I heard from all my peers. Thank you. Chris Herman, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. My name is Chris Herman, uh, 2426 North Lefebvre Avenue. Um, our family chose TOSA Connected, and I'd like to say that I do think that the TOSA Connected option is going well for my family. Um, I would also like to that my children and I think there are other children in the district as well who have already anxiety, um, just general anxiety, that this option is really a godsend for children and myself. Um, it's hard as a parent to always know if your child has a cough because it's allergies, asthma, don't want to go to school that day. Um, and I would really not want to put any teacher or staff member in a position where they weren't sure whether or not my child should be there. And my children also struggle with wanting to be in school with their peers, but also not wanting to be in an environment where they don't know day to day if going to be in school, out of school, um, so we do have conversations with children about safety and health, as I'm sure most families in the district do, that I appreciate that there's not a one-size-fits-all plan. Um, I would also like to commend the board um, on trying to make this work and also sticking with the metrics and having the health professionals come on and explain their, they approach the metrics and having those conversations using science um, and data to guide those decisions. Uh, finally, I'd echo the last speaker. Um, I really appreciate Mrs. Milfeld that even though you are in the, in the building, that you are also on the Zoom meeting that helps me connect faces with voices um, within the Zoom format. And so I appreciate that um, and that it is sometimes difficult to follow who is talking um, when it's the board room um, setting. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, Rinders and Schutz family, you have the microphone if you could please. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, this is Kristen and Schutz Rinders. Um, I'm at 436 North 111th Street. Um, first of all, I wanted to absolutely thank every single one of you for everything that you are doing. I don't think you hear that enough, um, and I don't think people take into consideration all the stuff you're doing 
outside of these insane five, six hour meetings that you're having, it's insane. You guys are incredible. We as families, we really appreciate it because you're doing this to keep our kids safe, our teachers safe. So ultimately, thank you. I also want to apologize because I feel like um, some parents feel the need to raise their voice and yell and bully and pressure. And that's not how you get change. That's not how you influence. And that's definitely not how you're going to get anything to move forward, especially those who are in person in the meeting. I do recommend we be appropriate when speaking to these people who are doing so much for our families. I 100% support hybrid. You guys have done so much for us and it is working. It's keeping us safe. It's keeping our teachers safe. It's keeping our kids safe. And I don't know how people can ignore the metrics you just shared. I don't know how you can ignore that Wisconsin is climbing everyone. Listen and listen clear. Wisconsin is climbing. The cases are climbing. We have hot spots. We are now one of three states in the nation that is a concern. Let's be responsible. Let's make good choices. Let's stop this silliness that they didn't just show us the metrics that supported this and act like we didn't hear it. It's ridiculous. Uh, one thing I do have to say that I agree with, it was really hard to understand what all that conversation was about about November 9th. I don't think anybody knows what you're coming to vote about. Is that a Tosa Connect thing? Was that not a, I, there was a little bit of confusion. It was very hard to hear the people with the masks on in the room. And we could only hear Sean, who, thank you, Sean, we can hear you, we appreciate it. But we just can't hear anybody in the room. And it's really hard being at home to know what that whole topic was even about. Um, so if you do, can you please just for a moment, update us what that number, what, what the meeting was for November 9th, what that vote was. But again, thank you so much. We really appreciate all of you and 100% yes hybrid, let's do this. Let's make a good choice. We'll come back December 1st. If it's safe, let's move forward. If it's not, we make the hard decisions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. Um, so for for the community, um, on December on I'm thinking of myself. On the twenty is it the twenty sixth? Twenty sixth of October, the district uh, team will be bringing forth a recommendation uh, to the board to take a look at um, options that we would be considering for adjustments and shifts um, for. Uh, Tosa Connected and Phase of the Learning to the board. We do not know what that recommendation will be. The district doesn't know what that recommendation will be. They will be taking, if this uh, recommendation, if tonight's vote is approved, they would be uh, kind of working on what the next, uh, the rest of the year would look like uh, for the Wauwatosa School District, what we could offer and what each of the different options would be. Dr. Erdl tonight uh, articulated that there would be a commitment to continuing Tosa Connected. There will be changes to the program uh, and what that will look like, and that will be spelled out. There will also be an opportunity, uh, more likely than not, that, well, there will be an opportunity for families to change which of the options that they want, and they will get uh, information on when they can make that decision and when that decision needs to be made by. We also talked about that we would be adding a couple of additional board meetings. Uh, I heard information tonight that in service was beneficial and helpful. Hearing from the staff was helpful. Uh, so that we are able to ask any and all questions we have in advance of the board meeting uh, and kind of have a conversation back and forth with the district leadership team to make sure before our final presentation is voted on, everyone feels comfortable. Uh, I think Sean's articulation was 99% locked in as um, an option. Um, and so that's that's what we would be doing. Um, I joked a little bit about Chet asking Sean since we'd like to schedule board meetings on Sean's family's birthdays. Uh, if there was any birthdays in that moment, there's not, so we'll find a time that works for all four members. Uh, but 26 is a key date for the community to know. Uh, that's the date when the recommendation will be coming uh, forward in a presentation to the board from the districts on what, uh, what the next phases would look like. And then the 9th would be the date that we'd be voting on, voting on it to be determined what meetings would occur in between the two. Any final community comments or questions? 
Uh, there are no more hands raised. Any questions or final comments from the board before? Um, yes, yeah, if I may comment. Um, I look at this with the comparison I'm about to draw. I, I grew up in La Crosse on the Mississippi River. And the sun could be shining in La Crosse, but if the Mississippi was flooding Minneapolis, we knew what was coming at us. And I, that's how I feel here. So regardless of how good Wauwatosa is, our immediate surrounding communities are showing stress, and certainly northeastern Wisconsin is showing great stress. And it just feels to me like the waters are rising upstream and it's coming at us. So that's the basis of my vote tonight. There seems to be enough time to go in either direction because the resolution authorizes planning by the superintendent for both contingencies, things being better and things being worse. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Gilman. Well, I would just like to give, so we've heard tonight kind of people wondering, right, is this based on the metrics? Is this based on, you know, issues with Tulsa Connect are not working? So as far as my vote tonight, I'm speaking just one of seven, my vote is almost primarily based on the metrics. The metrics are getting worse. We're trending worse. Um, if we were all green and everything looked good, I would be pushing the district very hard to get this back open. But we're not there, and I'm sure they would be able to do that. But we're not there. So the issues with Tulsa Connect or you know, staffing, those are really secondary for me. It's certainly important and we need to get it figured out, but the metrics aren't where they need to be for us to open. So as far as my vote, that, that's where it is. Um, like I said, if we were all green, I would be asking Dr. Earl, we need to have a plan to get our schools open. I'm not sure who the MS staff would be doing that. But that's not where we're at, so it's not even really a consideration. So the fact that we voted a month from now on the next thing, the metrics would have to substantially improve um, for us to get there. I hope they do. Seeing other, no other uh, board comment or questions, Dr. Riddle? I've got, I've got a question or comment, I guess. Uh, one is, can somebody in the room just kind of address um, what Deb Paul Halleck had brought up um, from the special ed um, standpoint and what she's seeing? Because that seems like it's, you know, it's brought up every meeting and, uh, and I just would love to understand uh, more about that because it, it just seems like we something we have to bring up as opposed to something that's baked in your presentation. So if somebody could speak to that, that'd be great. What what part? Uh, just to the extent that there's what staffing available for a special ed. It sounded like she was not sure if there was sufficient staffing to have a math teacher. That's at least what I heard. I guess what. What was the takeaways that you guys had and what what are we doing to ensure that there's smooth, good education happening for those students? You know, I think, I think if there's specific, uh, specific issues, I should go through the process and talk to the principal, talk to the people they need to. I know with uh, Deb's question, I said I would refer to the medical Maybe, but as far as staffing goes, we're fully staffed. I think there's, you know, whether people choose extended services um, for math or, or you know, there's different components for every student. I don't, that'd be the first I've heard of that we don't have enough staff for special education. And so I, I, I think we're staffed fully for, for special education at all levels. Um, so I'm not sure what exactly what the concern is, and I would encourage her to to reach out and talk to the principal if there's a specific question about staffing at a building or for her child. Okay, thank you. Okay, Liam, it's been about an hour, an hour and a half. If you read it, can you read the motion one more time so folks have a little pressure on what it was? Yes. 
Um, I'm coming in close to the mic, so hopefully this helps. It is recommended that the school board approve the school district stay in the current model of instruction hybrid for the phase into learning option. Planning and preparation for return to the classroom learning option beginning November 24th, 2020 is authorized. Thus, the earliest change to the phase into learning model of instruction to the classroom learning model would be December 1st, 2020. Return to the classroom learning model must be approved by the school board resolution prior to the return date. Planning and preparation for the virtual learning option is authorized. The superintendent in consultation with the medical public health advisory committee is authorized to shift to exclusively virtual instruction because of worsening metrics in Wauwatosa. Approval of the school board is not required for shift to virtual instruction. And I so move. And as a reminder, Mr. Doman previously seconded this. Ms. Newman, please call the roll. Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Newfeld? Yes. Ms. Mr. Rowland? Yes. Dr. Jessup Angert? Yes. That motion passes. Thank you all for the conversation, for the community, for the questions. Um, very appreciated. Next up, we have the Recreation Department annual update. I'm looking at the attendee list, and it better not drop. I'm expecting all of you to stick around for the Recreation Department update. Thanks the question while he sets up. Jamie, could you um, make sure to let the board know for meetings moving forward if you want us all, all on Zoom in the room? I know that there have been some previous challenges to that, and I, I really do want to make sure that community members can hear us all. So if before the next board meeting, we could have a recommendation whether it's more of us staying home and being on Zoom because of the feedback in the room or how we have all of us on Zoom so that the community can hear us, that would be uh, great. Definitely, it definitely helps when you lean into the mics. Okay, so basically just moving. We can do that. Yes, may I say that last meeting, I could hear Mark Carter very clearly, and um, Leanne right now, I could hear you very clearly, but you were leaning into the microphone and the microphone was about you know six, seven inches from your face, and that really, really made a difference, at least from where I am. Thanks, Mike. That's really helpful. Just as a comment, Lena, I can hear everyone in the board room very clearly. For the Zoom people, I can hear you all less clearly. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me this evening. Hopefully I can come in clear so everyone can hear me here. Uh, I'd like to just present here, not take too much of your time, uh, let you give you a quick update on uh, where the Recreation Department is at. So I've put together a presentation here. Um, front page here, if you did get your postcard in the mail, it would look familiar. Uh, real quick on this report, uh, it's going to serve as a recap for our programming that ran this uh, past winter and summer, as we know, spring, um, that is what it is. Uh, but also touch on the current plans uh, for our fall programming. And then I'll final uh, the presentation, finalize the presentation with uh, a list of projects and other items that the department's currently working on um, moving into the future. And of course, feel free to stop me at any time should you have any questions. Just refreshing ourselves and reminding ourselves of, of the mission statement for the uh, Recreation Department to enhance the quality of life for the Wauwatosa citizens of all ages by providing a variety of recreational activities, special events, and services which encourage lifelong learning, fitness, and fun. So this uh, past winter time, uh, we did end up just over 3,000 total registrations. Uh, just to recap on there, some of the su successful areas uh, with higher registration programs was the TBL, our Tulsa Basketball League, uh, fitness, dance, swim lessons, which obviously were indoors during the winter time. Um, I can't wait for Wednesday, which is the ICWW, and uh, senior programming, just to name, of the few, name uh, just a few of the areas. Uh, summer registration numbers, obviously were traditionally much higher than that. Um, I can't speak for 
summers in the past in Tosa since this was my first summer, um, but just recreation industry-wide. Um, we know the numbers are quite large in the summer because that's usually our wheelhouse. But some of the items and bullet points I would like to speak on is uh, summer programming was pushed back and we did begin the week of July 6th. Uh, summer adventure care uh, took place uh, both sides of town. We did offer at Longfellow Middle School as well as the West High School. Uh, strong registrations were in individual sports and programs, uh, which is pretty common to what you would see uh, with most activities. Uh, some of the areas that were popular examples were golf, swimming, tennis, tree climbing, which we do hold over at Hart Park. It's a pretty cool event. Gymnastics, track, and uh, babysitting, uh, which is uh, learning CPR and, and uh, other items that go along with training the young adults in the community about babysitting. Um, outdoor sports camps uh, saw a larger number of registrations versus the indoor camps, obviously due to COVID uh, guidelines, which have evolved since we did begin summer programming. Uh, between contractors and instructors, uh, not all were comfortable with leading programs and enrollment is extreme, extremely low in some areas. Uh, we had to cancel more than we would like, but for programs we were able to run, we did run them safely and the quality of the experience was top notch as the community would expect. Continuing on here, I would like to put a spotlight on some of the coworkers that I have in the recreation department on some of the areas that they were able to accomplish with the ever-changing guidelines. Um, so I wanna make sure that I acknowledge them and I'm extremely proud of what they were able to accomplish and what they are moving forward within the guidelines. Um, First bullet point here is, is from Steve. Um, we did actually have a total of four, uh, excuse me, 40 teams participating in the summer adult softball league. We did run a short league. Um, keep in mind those 40 teams are spread out throughout the week. They're not all in one night. Um, we did uh, successfully run the track and uh, track club, running club. Traditionally it is run on the, um, the uh, running track surface, uh, but we did come in uh, contact or in, in conflict with uh, some of the resurfacing being done and it just happened to be that we were also working on it uh, district but then also at Hart Park they were doing theirs as well so it did uh, turn into uh, interesting but Steve did find a way to find a location on district to continue to run that program. Uh, senior programming was thinking outside the box as we all are and creatively uh, they did offer over there at Hart Park by the Mueller building, uh, a drive through luau. Uh, if anybody's on the Facebook page for the Tulsa Rec, they did have some photos of that. Um, they sure did have fun doing it. And uh, they were driving through, they got a donated pineapple that was donated to the senior center from the, from the community. Uh, they uh, did offer uh, senior daily coffee clutches, uh, adult enrichment classes from book reviews to Tai Chi to yoga. Um, as well as a cellist actually had uh, came in. Um, this is all done outside. Uh, they found a way to do it uh, safely and spaced out. Um, and I made sure I popped in several times as well as for the little concert that they had the cellist. It was, it was, it was quite an experience. And just to see the faces um, that you can imagine were behind the masks are what makes what we do every day important. Um, Chris Johnson, our facility scheduler, um, as some of you know, he, he had worked earlier on uh, this um, COVID guidelines and had developed with the uh, assistance of IT, as well as uh, getting my hands involved, developed the online registration process uh, for limited individual use of outdoor fields at our school district property. Um, we had limited amount of fields that we did use, uh, but we did uh, do that during a period of time between May it lasted until about uh, June when the field reservations were able to get back rolling uh, with the limited amount of participants per field. Um, outdoor swim lessons uh, under the supervision of Kristen. She was able to begin doing outdoor swim lessons at the Tosa pool. Uh, we began on June 15th uh, with the collaboration and close communication with the director over there, Ken Slosky. Um, so we appreciated all they did to allow us to continue to be involved in their uh, outdoor pool running the swim lessons. I know it was with communication to her, it was, it was quite difficult to figure out what they needed to do, uh, but for them to open up the outdoor pool uh, was uh, 
a huge, a huge asset to the community, which then allowed us to offer this some lessons out there. So, uh, uh, and then for the indoor swim lessons, uh, we did begin that the week of July 14th. Uh, Kristen worked very closely as she did with the outdoor staff, as well as the indoor staff, outstanding training and organization to safely usher participants onto the pool deck and out when the next lessons were set to begin. Uh, just finalizing a couple bullet points here with the coordinators notes. Um, Greg, one of our newer program coordinators, uh, he worked closely uh, to really identify, as I had noted earlier, about individual sports. How can we take golf and how can we really work on putting that on a little bit of a pedestal and getting people out there uh, out of the larger groups. Uh, so he worked very closely with them. So we saw some really positive numbers with both our youth as well as our adult lessons. And as I had noted earlier about tree climbing, um, we do that over at, there's a tree that's right near the skate park that they, they use. And uh, I think it was channel 58, they had done a little spot in the morning as well. So um, it's a great program and great contractor that we work with to get that completed. Uh, Summer Adventure Care, uh, Jenny did a, quite a great job trying to put all those pieces together. Uh, we did begin the week of July 6th, uh, making sure we can get the staff in and get proper training, doing training virtually, and putting all those pieces together to make sure that we were doing everything in our power, working alongside um, Caitlin, uh, the school district nurse, and making sure the guidelines are there. We were more on the front end during the summer really starting to roll some of these programs out when we were still starting to figure out uh, the guidelines and what was happening. So uh, that was a program that was very important to the community to make sure we get, gave those parents, those working parents or parents that needed that peace of mind that their children were gonna be supervised in a safe environment. Um, and finalizing on not forgetting Diana, administrative assistant. Um, she, throughout this whole time, we were in remotely and other points um, she really knocked out of the park, making sure that she got everything she needed to get done for our department, uh, working remotely. Um, when she's used to having quite a large amount of desk space to lay everything out and uh, kind of go through everything there. So I wanted to make some points and make sure I put a spotlight on all the, the folks that are in the department that put a lot of long uh, hours and efforts to really make things work for the community. I did want to point on, since we are leaving the our traditional high time for seasonal employees, uh, we did have a total of 135 summer employees uh, that successfully and safely ran an outstanding experience for all the participants that were involved or chose to be involved this summer during our programming. Uh, current plans for the fall, we adjusted programming uh, start date uh, to the week of July, excuse me, July, ooh, September 21st. Uh, we did that uh, after discussion just to give the families in the community times to concentrate on household logistics, school work, and all the other factors that go into it. And we wanted to be there to supplement that and give them the additional opportunities after they've able to go through uh, and they continue to go through um, really hard decisions. We did opt to go with the postcard mailing to the community instead of uh, a fall program guide that traditionally has gone out uh, just to streamline the communication and registration process is also offering real-time options and updates on fall programming. With the ever-changing, it was important to really make sure that we kind of trimmed down um, and had a streamlined communication through our website and other portals. Uh, we continue to add programs as space is available, COVID guidelines adjust, and the contractors and instructors are comfortable in returning. Um, so as time allows and staff get more comfortable, um, we are continuing to add programs and evaluating what we can do for the fall. Uh, evaluating, researching, and working with our contractors and our instructors and adding online virtual program options as well is that that's always on the forefront of our discussions most every day. If we can't run the program, is it an option to possibly run an option of virtual for the community? So we're putting everything we can out there for them. Usually in the fall, we would have a trunk or treat special event. Um, but in lieu of that, uh, we are going to be organizing and going through the details of putting out a drive up uh, food drive uh, with collaboration with uh, Tulsa Care. So there's going to be more details in regards to that coming up. Um, plans and projects currently and for the future uh, facility register, excuse me, uh, facility recreation entrance doors and info with photos. So um, traditionally, we would just tell people addresses of where to go for programming. 
Um, and they would just figure it out as they go. I figured that out as a participant when I first started here. I had taken a class over at Longfellow. I realized there's an entrance to go in, but once I went in there, I had no clue where I was going. I called one of my coworkers after like my first week there and he explained where to go. So I realized from personal experience, there's more information that needs to be out there for our community. So we've actually added to our website, a listing of each one of the locations we're using, the, the call numbers or call letters for the entrance doors and also on where they can find that. And we've also added photos where they can click on it it brings them to a screen so they can actually physically see where they would need to be for uh, programming within the facility. Uh, we are analyzing and looking at renaming program areas and organizations of subcategories uh, just in regards to consistency between our website, um, our registration, which is RecTrack, as well as what used to be our program guide. There was some inconsistency, so we're looking at um, streamlining and uh, reorganizing those so they're all consistent and no confusion for the community. Uh, senior programming, uh, they did receive a grant from the Green Bay Packers Foundation um, that is going to be communicated. Sarah, communications coordinator, will be sending something out. Uh, so it's quite exciting uh, that our senior uh, staff were able to go out for that and that we did receive it. The main emphasis that they're going to use some of that funding for is to bring some technology to the forefront for the senior population that uh, participate in our programming. Uh, as we know with connecting with folks, whether it's FaceTime or Zoom or any of those things, having some of those items there available, but then also just checking email and staying up and up in touch with all that. So uh, that is an area that I wanted to touch on and say congratulations as well to our senior staff for senior programming staff for uh, receiving that grant with the Green Bay Packers. Um, we are looking at equipment rental bags. Uh, one of the areas is uh, pickleball. It's extremely popular uh, throughout the country um, and the trend continues to go up. So we're, over the winter months, we're gonna be working on developing a process for rental of, uh, renting of equipment bag uh, through our department um, and then possibly looking at branching out to other sports uh, that could be available. So we're gonna work on that during the winter months and really identify and talk to other communities and other rec departments uh, around us within the state and even in my old state in Illinois to identify what works and what doesn't work so we can build upon that. Uh, moving the part-time recreation employees from which is currently, believe it or not, is paper timesheets to an electric, uh, electronic format is another project that we're working on right now. Uh, we are adding recreation monitors to the middle and the high schools. Traditionally, we've done just the elementary schools during the summertime we did have for customer service, COVID guidelines, supervision, as well as cleaning high touch areas within the areas or within the spaces that we use. We did see success in that. So we are going to continue that through the school year. And we do have the staffing for the recreation monitors to do that. Um, we are looking at some of the final steps in researching uh, the credit card processing uh, gateway, which is the wording they use to collect fees over the internet for online registration. We are looking at switching over that to save overall for our contract and monthly fees. That's the, the topic we're currently touching on. And then also ramping up the engagement on Facebook, uh, being part of the district emails to the families and the district employees, as well as a cleaner layout on our website or some of the other projects we're working on. Some comments here, I didn't put folks' names on here, but I just wanted to put a spotlight on some of the thank yous that we received, some of the testimonials from over the summer, um, from the adult softball thanking for at least putting together a short season um, on such a notice they were able to pivot and make it work. There's a couple comments here in regards to the summer adventure care um, and the, the energies and the care and the addressing of safety, masks, and the communication to everybody. So. I just wanted to make sure I put that there for everyone to be able to look at uh, the nice comments that we did receive uh, from the community. That would be my presentation. Um, just want to thank you for your time. Should you have any questions, you're welcome to ask, or if not, you know how to find me. May I ask a question? Mr. Meyer, you're second after Ms. Weefro. Oh, thank you. Okay, now this is better. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. I really appreciate your presentation. I was so looking forward to it. Um, <clears throat> so I have received feedback on the program this summer. And one of the things that I learned was the idea of the helicopter. 
Kids in the Dose Cares program, how that they're, they're, you know, this is how far you should be away from <laughs> No, it works. It works. I'm gonna ask Jay. I'm gonna ask Jay tomorrow. And I'm gonna to go into the office swinging my arms. So yeah. yeah, I mean it works. So, um, so I heard uh, some very good uh, feedback on the programming, and, um, and I just want to congratulate you and the team for that. Uh, also, I wanted to ask a question about uh, on-site personnel. Did we have uh, anybody, uh, students on-site, kind of monitoring the entrances or? How was that working? And yeah, so uh, dur during the summer months, uh, with guidance from uh, from the school district nurse of Caitlin, as well as other administration staff, uh, we did have our traditional recreation monitors um, at all the locations that we had recreation programming, um, as well as uh, rental groups that would have been scheduled through the facility schedule out of the recreation department. The summer adventure care, we actually had a separate entrance than what other folks would have came through for rec programming that we did have. And while they went through there, they did have the separate check-in process and all the other um, steps that were included and asked upon us to be doing to make sure that the folks that were coming in for the summer adventure care, because they were long, there for a longer period of time that your tra traditional programming in and out um, were definitely put into place. Hopefully that answers it. If it not, did. okay. Yeah, yeah I Perfect. just wasn't sure with the monitors and I, I think directionally that's really helpful too since a lot of things in our building have been changing mm -hmm. and so you know i think what you've done with the program um, is, is really nice and thank you thank you very creative <laughs> try to be thank you mr martin thank you so uh, i am a uh, a new member of the Wauwatosa City Senior Commission. Uh, a topic of discussion at a meeting last week was pickleball, and it seems that it's becoming quite a big deal. I have no prior knowledge of this, but I only am reporting what I was told. Uh, I had sent some advanced questions to you all, and thank you for answering them. And um, the uh, follow up that I have. I'm carrying in here is the request for um, adjustable nets at the tennis court sites that I'm told pickleball has a lower net than the regular um, tennis court net. And I don't know anything about either sport. So please forgive me for my failings here, but I'm, I'm a promoter now of something happy for seniors. And um, also there's a request for classes. Uh, we're told that uh, Waukesha, for example, offered a number of pickleball classes and they were all full. So um, we'll, we'll, I'm here just stating those requests. If we can find a space in our programming for some classes and if we can find some funds in our building and grounds money to um, provide, um, you know, the lower nets. I understand that you're accommodating some of the lining requirements. There's a special blue lining that um you're you're doing on some of the courts is do i have that am i understanding that correctly matt yes yes there is and by chance i i did give you some information back hopefully you'll find that valuable and try to identify some of those questions you had and and also attach some photos for visuals as well so yeah well in the meeting here i'm trying to to make the buzz louder for pickleball for the seniors of our community so mm -hmm. um I appreciate your patience with me here. Oh, no, that, that's that's great. And actually speaking with Costa, who oversees uh, the senior program, it also oversees uh, the tennis and pickleball during the summer, um, had already noted to me the trend on that and identifying how we can expand their current lining, what do we need, portable nets, um, and some other items, as well as uh, the city park, Hart Park, with the, feet, the courts there. Um, and could we do more evening classes because there is lights. So. Lots of good discussion happening in regards to this topic. Uh, so definitely more to come um, in regards to what can be offered uh, and to, to what amount. Uh, but yeah, definitely uh, keep eyes open for what will be out there coming. Well, I, I look forward to that information and I, I hope we give you a chance to present it in the boardroom. And uh, I have to say it sure is fun to 
be advocating for something happy like this. It, it's a, it's a nice, um, a, a nice topic. So thank you. Eric? Really? I think Sean's ready. Sean, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, before I dive into this, uh, we got an email um, from somebody who's watching on Zoom uh, on the last session that was saying that, uh, that they overheard somebody, uh, I guess, cuss at Mr. McClough um, during a part where they were wrapping up their comments. I didn't hear that. Um, but if that did happen, I just want to make it clear that that is unacceptable, that this room needs to always be a room of decorum and respect and uh, discussion. And if that's, if that's what happened, um, then that is something that we should all you know, condemn and um, is not something that we should allow. So I guess that's number one. Uh, number two is related to this presentation. You know, thank you for the report. I can't even imagine how difficult it must be to run a rec department in this environment. Uh, the thing that I consistently struggle with related to the rec department reports that we get is, um, in my mind, it's always a question of like, what does success look like? Like what is the, the five year vision that we're building to, you know, what does success look like for seniors versus, you know, teens versus, uh, you know, toddler, you know, tots, whatever. <laughs> like how do we know we're winning um, and what are we building towards is, is maybe moving away from paper to online payments to mitigate the costs associated with it. So. Things like that and like a future report, I know we're going to be working on a strategic plan for the board in the next you know, couple months. Um, and it would be cool if, uh, I know we at one point did a similar plan for the rec department, um, but maybe this, the rec department could be baked into the strategic plan that the board is putting together. I just put it out there to say, um, maybe you have an opinion on that already, or if you know not ready for tonight, then um, you know, how do we integrate something like that in the future? Sean, that's a great comment. And that's something that I envision uh, in regards to having a roadmap. Um, but being in less than a year and obviously everything else that has been thrown into it, uh, but the goal is to definitely have a roadmap. So no matter who's coming, or who's going within a department, there's still something that somebody can open up and identify where they are on that map and where they need to continue to accomplish that trip. So no, your, your, your comments are right on board with where my brain's at. So thank you for bringing it up. I had three things. Sean hit the first one. So thank you, long-term plan and historical where we're trying to get to. The second thing is to say thank you for highlighting your staff. I can only imagine how hard they worked and to just see their names, I think is, is really important. And uh, the last thing is that I was really excited to see this idea of a drive up food drive for Chelsea Cares. Um, and would love to see how we promote something like that. I don't, I don't know if it's drop off or pick up either are great. Uh, I think our community has been amazing with the pop up food pantries at a number of our schools. And I, I just really liked the idea of turning an event that a lot of folks are maybe sad about with, with Halloween maybe not looking like we hoped it would into something productive for the community. So thank you for turning that on its head. Oh, and then final thing, pickleball is all the talk in the Jacobus Park neighborhood. So <laughs> I had never even heard of it until about two weeks ago, and that's all anybody's talking about while they're walking their dogs. So something happened, and it's out in the, it's out in the ether. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments on site? Any community comments on the site? There are no not in raised. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us tonight. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. I have a Elementary student is excited about gymnastics. Good stuff. Um, any final public comment on any non agenda items? 
There are no hands raised. Seeing none, may I have a motion to adjourn at 9.55? Move to adjourn. Thank you, Chair. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Fraley. Ms. Newman, please call the roll. Mr. Doman? Yes. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Newfeld? Yes. Mr. Rowland? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes, and we are adjourned at 9.56 p.m. Thank you both.